On June 13, 1983, the quiet streets of 6th Avenue and the city of Anchorage screeched in horror when 17-year-old Cindy Paulson was found running down the lane, barefoot and handcuffed, shouting for help. A driver on the road would offer Cindy a lift to the station and return her to safety. Next day, the city of Anchorage would wake up to the news that they had been harboring Alaska's most notorious serial killer through the last 13 years. Drive from work, drive up town in a hurry, and sit there and just look at the on the street. And give me uh, this here big ball of chart. I got this thrill of when they would open the door, it was something, a key turned over from right to wrong to right again where it was all right on these here I could do, do things with them that I couldn't do with a good one. Robert Christian Hansen was born on February 15, 1939, at Esterville, Iowa. Hansen appeared to have multiple mental illnesses spawned by his troubled childhood. Being painfully shy and skinny, Hansen was targeted as a weakling while being afflicted by stammering due to severely acute acne and permanent scarring. The body dysphoria caused him to refer to himself as a big giant pimple, being unable to envision himself within the social norms of manhood. Shunned by the attractive girls in school, Hansen grew up hating them and nursing fantasies of cruel revenge. His father was a Danish immigrant who owned a small bakery in the heart of the city and was known to be a strict disciplinarian resulting in Hansen not having an easy childhood. He worked for long hours in the family bakery from a young age. Though he was naturally left-handed, he was forced by his stern father to use his right hand instead, a switch that resulted in a lifelong stutter. Treated as an outcast by both his family and his peers at school, Hansen soon developed early signs of depression. As a social reject, he took refuge in time spent alone. Over time, he became an avid big-game hunter, channeling his rage and fantasies of vengeance into the sport of stalking animals. In 1957, 18-year-old Robert Hansen joined the U.S. Army Reserve to make a living for himself. After serving a year in the reserves, he became an assistant drill instructor in Pocahontas, Iowa, and married a young woman he met there. While life had given Hansen a fair chance to restart and progress on a fresh note, his bloodthirsty nature derived from having been mistreated by the society soon took control of him. In 1960, at age 21, he convinced a young bakery employee to help him burn down a school bus garage. Later, when the boy confessed to the crime, Hansen was arrested. This incident outraged his wife, and she resorted to file for a divorce, thus abandoning Hansen to be alone and incarcerated. Though his three-year-long sentence for arson was reduced to just 20 months, he was later apprehended on a few occasions in relation to charges of petty theft. Later, in 1967, he wed another Pocahontas native, and she followed him to Anchorage, Alaska, where he opened up his own bakery and prospered in a new land. Hansen took flying lessons and purchased his own private plane, earning the reputation as an outdoorsman and a hunter who stalked dull sheep, wolves, and bears, using rifles or bows and arrows. He moved into a small community, had two children with his wife, and settled into a quiet routine. Though Hansen maintained a wholesome reputation in the town, he let his hidden dark side run wild in the woods of Alaska. Throughout the 70s and early 80s, Hansen targeted multiple sex workers and exotic dancers, abducting the woman to later turn them loose in the woods. Yana said, hey, don't go any further, stay there. And she started running this way here and uh, ran after her. She was running down the road and uh, I caught up with her. I grabbed her in the hair. She had a big knife in her purse, big black handled buck knife. And uh, she grabbed that and swung around and I, I grabbed her, her hands and uh, I took her down. She was started screaming at me and all that, uh, don't kill me, don't kill me. I can remember I was, uh, she was laying face down and uh, I just took her. Everything happened so fast, you know, I'm fighting with it and then all of a sudden I was, I uh, killed her. In the late 70s, society was still ages behind on women protection laws. Legal counselors evidently avoided cases of sex workers and assault victims as they were too much of a trouble to deal with. In 1972, 
Hansen was arrested twice, once for the abduction and attempted assault of a housewife, and again for assaulting a Serving less than six months on a reduced charge, he was picked up again in 1976 for shoplifting a chainsaw. Convicted of larceny, he was sentenced to five years in prison, but the verdict was overturned on appeal as the Alaska Supreme Court regarded his sentence as too harsh. Unknown to local authorities, his killing spree began in 1973, likely emboldened by his ability to walk free after his early crimes. He told me, of course, if I called the police, that he would hunt me down and kill me. He told me he was a fine, outstanding businessman. He had never mentioned at any point when, uh, during the time or, or before or after that he was married, but he said he's a fine, outstanding businessman and that I was just a kid and nobody would believe me. Hansen's visible activities were only the tip of the iceberg that primarily hid his lethal personality. In 1983, more than a decade after Hansen moved to Anchorage, Cindy Polson was rescued off the streets of 6th Avenue, uncovering the gruesome tale of Alaska's Butcher Baker. On June 13, 1983, Cindy was picked up by Hansen with the promise of $200 in exchange for intimate relations. She was white, uh, very short. I can't remember if I picked her up in one of, as a dancer or if she was a food uptown. No, I picked her up and uh, told her I was going to take her, I was going to go to my home. I just pointed down at her, I said, now look, if you do exactly what I tell you, and don't give me any problems whatsoever, you won't get hurt anywhere, she like, I, 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 uh, I have problems with that. Everything was the way it was supposed to happen. This time it didn't, it didn't go right. Right after getting in his car, she was held at gunpoint and was brought down to his place at Muldoon. There, Cindy had to endure severe torture and physical assault repeatedly as Hanson would let his wild thoughts run to extreme ends. Later, he attempted to load her off onto a plane to take her to his cabin in the Matanuska Susitna Valley, about 35 miles north of Anchorage. As the plane was about to take off, Cindy was able to get one of her hands free and then run for her life. Thinking strategically, she was able to leave behind a shoe of hers as primal evidence. The description of the abductor fit perfectly with Robert Hansen's profile. Cindy also provided information on his stutter and identifying characteristics about the plane to aid the investigation. But police were still reluctant to bring him in because even though Hansen was no stranger to troubles with the law, the local bakery was well-liked within the community. Hansen admitted that he had met the girl but claimed she was setting him up since he refused to pay her extortionate demands. When he told police about his strong alibi provided by a friend, he was released. Meanwhile, Alaska state troopers were beginning to get anxious of the serial killer at loose. In 1980, a few construction workers at a site near Eklutna Road discovered decomposed remains of a woman. Stabbed to death in 1979, her real identity remained undisclosed, while she was instead dubbed as Eklutna Annie by the police assigned to work the case. Later that year, the corpse of Joanna Messina was found in a gravel pit near Seward, and a special task force was organized to probe these killings. When more dead bodies began to show up near the Matanuska Susitna Valley, along with two 23 shell casings lying beside them, Hansen was labeled as a prime suspect. But mere suspicion wasn't enough for officers to take any course of action, as they were waiting for evidence that directly linked him. The investigation remained open with new bodies turning up almost each coming day. The complex array of situations called for now-retired FBI agent John Douglas, who had helped pioneer the field of criminal profiling. Douglas was able to put together a psychological profile of the killer, diagnosing his motive and mode of carrying out killings. Robert Hansen had a previous record of severe depression and borderline schizophrenic episodes. Diagnosed of being an infantile personality, he was obsessed with getting back at people whom he felt had wronged him. The police soon obtained a warrant to search Hansen's plane, car, and homes. The gravity of the whole situation was too macabre for legal officers to sink in. Hansen was a well-known businessman, while it was his hobbies which made him ward of the town. Known for his skills as a bow hunter, the den in Hansen's home was decorated with hunting trophies and stuffed animals mounted on the walls. He had even set a few bow hunting records, 
but the renowned citizen also shared an interest in collecting trophies from another kind of kill. His modus operandi was to pick up a hooker in his car and force her at gunpoint to bring her home. He would then assault her and take her out to a secluded area to hunt her down, as if she were a mere animal to satisfy Hansen's wild desires. He would kidnap these women and either drive them in his car or fly his private bush plane to his cabin in the remote Alaskan wilderness. These women would remain chained to their helplessness, and while most women wouldn't even put up a fight, the ones who did had suffered the death at the hands of Alaska's most nightmarish serial killer. Out in the wilderness, his favorite location was along the Kinnick River. Robert Hansen would set the women free for a brief moment, when they would hope that it was their chance to escape. As they ran for their lives, he tracked them down, then taking his own sweet little time, hunting them down like wild animals. I guess I wanted to control things. It made me feel masculine or powerful. But this time it went too far. Armed with his hunting knife and a 223 caliber Ruger Mini-14 rifle, he tortured the woman with his chase for hours or sometimes for days on until he located his prey and shot them like in a hunting game. While searching the butcher baker's home, police found an aviation map of the area hidden in the headboard of his bed. It was marked with tiny X's, which denoted the killing and burial sites of his victims. While some of these marked places matched with the information that police had, there were a total of 24 X's marked across the map, despite the police being aware of only three at the time. Detective Douglas knew from the murderer's profile that this man would have a keen interest in keeping trophies from the victims. And, quite evidently, in the basement of Hansen's home, police found a stash of jewelry. In the stash was a necklace that belonged to one of the victims. Faced with the evidence in 1984, Hansen confessed to murdering 17 women and assaulting another 30 women over a 12-year period between 1971 and 1983. I was watching national news, and there was Bob Hansen. And I thought, what the hell is Bob Hansen doing on national news? And I turned it up, and it said, this is the greatest mass murder in the history of Alaska. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea. That guy was in my house, at my dinner table. Following that year, in 1984, Robert Hansen was sentenced to 461 plus life imprisonment with no chance to parole. He was imprisoned at Spring Creek Correctional Center in Seward, Alaska. The plea bargain to Alaska's Butcher Baker denoted that he was only charged for four murder victims out of the 17 he confessed to have murdered. The third time they called back and said that he had confessed and they wouldn't need me. So um, I hung up the phone when we were done talking, I got my son off to school, got my husband out the door, and um, proceeded to fall apart. I started crying. I couldn't stop. I had no control over it. It controlled me. I could see each and every one of those women, how they died, probably hunted down like dogs, wounded, and then hunted more. If rumors were to be believed, there was an estimate of over 20 victims who remained unknown till the date in exchange of the reduction that would make him eligible for parole. Details regarding victims' information and burial grounds were sought from Hansen. Robert Hansen agreed to assist the police in locating the remaining bodies plotted over across his kill map. While he had marked all of his victims out, the whereabouts of five of them still remains unknown. Hansen took the secret of their locations to his grave. Robert Hansen died within his correction center in 2014 at the age of 75. We definitely heard, like, maybe at least, first it was five shots. Then it was like two more shots after that. Right at uh, 10.55, the 35-year-old uh, victim was arriving home from work when she was confronted by her strange husband who shot her. On October 31st, 2023, in the silent town of Katy, Texas, a sudden clamor of noise would jolt the quiet neighborhood. 
At around 11 p.m., the neighbors would hear the last shrieks of help yelled out by the 35-year-old mother of three, Nitya Devi Ramru. On Halloween's night, while coming back home after work, Nitya reached her driveway when she felt someone's presence behind her back. She was merely a few feet away from her doorway when her estranged husband, Bisham, fatally shot her from behind. The entire sequence of events happened in a flash. While the neighbors and kids were breaking down in a panicked state within their homes, Nitya's children, being watched by her sister that night, were also woken up by the loud clamor. Bisham then proceeded to walk towards Nitya's house and broke himself in as he attempted to meet his children. Nitya's sister intervened in a timely manner and reacted according to the situation, guarding the kids by putting her own life at stake. Bisham Ramruk wasn't armed, but picked up a glass shard and attacked the sister while being in a barbaric state, leaving out ghastly injuries to both the parties. Bisham fled the scene almost immediately after attacking the sister, leaving the children unharmed. In an uncanny turn of events, Bisham was found dead on the road, nearly a mile away from Nitya's house, injured with a self-inflicted shot. Harris County deputies then arrived at the crime scene after receiving concerning calls from neighbors. We definitely heard like maybe at least, first it was five shots, then it was like two more shots after that. After that, we just kind of just laid low and prayed that everything was okay. The officers discovered Nitya's cold dead body lying in the driveway while her sister was found inside the house having suffered severe stab wounds. Due to the quick response, Nitya's sister was able to survive the fall. But Nitya, on the other hand, wasn't lucky enough to save herself from the unfortunate fate. The whole ordeal happened right before the final divorce proceedings of Nitya and Bisham, scheduled for November 6th. Further investigations unfolded a series of abuses that had Nitya file a protective order against her husband before the separation procedures were completed. South Asian households could display a set of restricted cultural values that in many cases discourage women in the family who seek escape from abusive partners. The wives might be expected to hold on to certain strings of moral code that would justify even their partner's derogatory actions to them, as these acts could be portrayed as adjustments done as a part of matrimony. Nitya, after years of putting up with physical and emotional violence, finally consulted attorney Ushi Ohia for legal counsel. To hear that her worst fears came to pass, it just, it breaks my heart. By the end of my representation of her, unfortunately, she was, she was very, very strong and she wanted to start a new life and she wanted to make sure that herself and, and her children were protected. Bisham and Nitya shared 18 years of married life together. They had three kids aged 16, 13, and 7. Nitya's friend shared a peculiar incident when Bisham had followed Nitya to a bar where she was enjoying with a few friends. Seeing her having a good time, Bisham, in an action out of pure rage, tried to drag Nitya off, only to be stopped by her friend's spouse who intervened due to the extreme nature of the situation. Bisham did leave the space after that, but not before vandalizing Nitya's car, which was parked outside. Her in-laws were adamant on pushing for the divorce as they highlighted children's custody issues and marital property disputes to be matters of grave concern, causing deep differences between the couple. Bisham didn't hesitate to threaten Nitya that she would be facing consequences if she continued with the proceedings and tried to get her part of property shares. The family, especially Bisham's sister, would often show up at her place of work or at the local grocery store to humiliate or emotionally push Nitya to take her case back. Bisham's actions definitely didn't stop, even after their formal separation. Nitya, on a regular basis, spotted Bisham stalking her and hence feared for her life. Local authorities remained indifferent, choosing not to act based on circumstances, as there weren't any direct signs of threat to her. A spokesperson for the Harris County Sheriff's Office in Houston said Nitya had contacted them in June 2023, claiming Bishan was following her, and they had suggested she should contact her attorney. Nitya's fear was termed as paranoia by Legal Protection Services, while her attorney, Ohia, was actively looking for ways to help her family at the earliest. Further investigation brought out another concerning instance when Bisham was found playing around with knives during one of the couple's fights. The heated argument aggravated, resulting him in pushing Nitya down at the kitchen counter 
while intimidating her with a knife in hand. The disturbing part of the whole ordeal was that it happened right in the presence of the kids, who were traumatized to the core and grew numb toward the conflict at one point. The Child Protection Services authorized an order about a month ago after having received an anonymous tip from the kids' school, but Nitya knew better than to just blindly rely on that order. We had many conversations about what she should do to protect herself, her children, to get her share of the marital estate and start her life over, Ohia says. Nitya was hopeful she would get herself and her kids out of the situation they were in, together with her fair share of marital property, which would help enable them to start a new life for themselves. But sadly, that was not to be. Nitya Devi Ramru stands as a brave example in the society today, where abuse may often be swept under the rug, merely on the grounds of cultural values. The individual we witness in this footage is Emma Cal The individual we witness in this footage is Emma Caldwell, a 27-year-old resident of Glasgow. She was last seen on this CCTV footage on April 4, 2005. Days passed without any word from her until her family reported her missing to the police on April 5th. The police immediately launched a search to trace her steps, hoping to find her safe and sound. But little did anyone know, no one could have imagined the terrifying turn that was about to take place in Emma's life. Five weeks later, on May 5th, 2005, that's when the police found her, alone, her lifeless body lying naked in the desolation of the woods. It's a tragic sight, one that pierces the heart. A young woman, stripped of all clothing, no protection from the elements, no one deserved to be left in such a haunting, isolated manner. The grim reality was devastating. Her body had the marks of a cruel fate. She wasn't just found, she was strangled. Her lifeless eyes closed, her once vibrant body now turned a haunting shade of blue. Who was Emma Caldwell? And what sequence of events led to her gruesome fate? Follow us on this journey as we uncover the key evidence in this puzzle. Can this lone clue reveal what really happened to Emma and who could be behind it all? Like any big city, Glasgow had its tough spots, dealing with more crime than others. As the second largest city in Scotland, Glasgow has a rate of 768 crimes per 10,000 people. Yet the people here were strong and supportive. They stood together, helping each other through tough times. Emma's story turned out tragic in this intriguing mix of a place. Her absence left a big gap. But there's a small hope. Somewhere in South Lancashire, near Bigar and Roberton, there might be answers to piece together her story. The tragic tale of Emma Caldwell, found in the woods, echoes through the land, a reminder of the mysteries that sometimes linger, even in Scotland's most enchanting corners. Emma Caldwell was born on September 2, 1977, in Scotland, to her devoted mother, Margaret Caldwell, and father, William Caldwell. Growing up, Emma had a childhood filled with typical hobbies, yet her true passion lay in horse riding. It was an activity that resonated deeply within her. It gave her peace and joy. However, her life took a significant turn when tragedy struck her family. At the tender age of 20, Emma faced the loss of her sister, Karen Caldwell, an event that profoundly affected her. Her world began to shift as it spiraled into a place shadowed by grief. When she tried to find comfort, she faced an overwhelming storm of emotions, battling a pain that felt impossible to overcome. Within the sanctuary of the stables where she worked, Emma came across heroin, a promise to numb the ache in her heart. This marked the beginning of a journey, overshadowed by the gripping hold of addiction. Despite efforts from her parents to extend a helping hand, Emma found herself trapped by the force of heroin and this was also the time when she had been living in a hostel for two years. It became the center of her life and dictated her choices, which led her down a path she never anticipated. To sustain her habit, Emma turned to the streets of Glasgow and engaged in sex work to fuel the relentless demands of addiction. Despite these struggles, she remained connected to her family, found comfort in their company, and frequently visited them. Emma found comfort in her mother, Margaret 
who remained a constant presence. Amidst the chaos of Emma's life, Margaret provided care, did simple things like laundry, and created a sense of normalcy for her daughter. Emma, as described by those who knew her intimately, was perceived as naive and trusting. Her vulnerability seemed to draw her towards companionship with those facing similar battles. She formed bonds with friends who, like her, went through a similar landscape of addiction and hardship in their lives. The fateful night of her disappearance on April 5, 2005, marked a tragic chapter in Emma's story. She was last seen between 12.30 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. that day on London Road, Glasgow. She left her hostel, captured by CCTV cameras, as she ventured towards Glasgow's red light district and never returned again. Her sudden absence made her family search desperately, night after night, hoping for her safe return. Five days later, on April 10, 2005, her family filed a missing person report, intensifying efforts to find her. Tragically, five weeks after her disappearance, Emma's lifeless body emerged in the woods at Roberton, near Bigar, South Lancashire, on May 8, 2005. She was stripped naked and choked to death. The sight, scattered with items unrelated to her, painted a grim picture of the widespread sexual activity in the area. The investigation uncovered many complexities. Emma's phone revealed a list of clients from different backgrounds. This discovery sparked a closer investigation in search of what would be a harrowing truth. The investigation into Emma Caldwell's tragic death was a determined pursuit, spanning numerous years. Led by a team from Police Scotland, working closely with the Scottish Police Authority and the Crown Office. They, under the guidance of Senior Investigating Officer Detective Superintendent Graham Mackey, carefully gathered information and left no stone unturned in their quest for answers. Initially, their focus was to retrace Emma's steps. They methodically reviewed CCTV footage, interviewed witnesses, and traced her digital footprints. This process pinpointed her last known movements, which were between 12.30 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. on April 5, 2005, on London Road, Glasgow. This helped them create a timeline of events. The police shared an image of a jacket resembling the one Emma was wearing on the CCTV footage. The dark brown suede jacket, featuring an imitation fur collar and cuffs, remains unaccounted for, as does the dark-colored handbag she had with her at the time. As they looked through the scenes, they found various clues that each hinted at a fragment of the truth. The discovery of items like women's clothing and porn magazines scattered around the woods, where Emma's body was discovered, triggered a detailed examination. These articles, although unrelated to Emma directly, formed part of the puzzling backdrop. They pursued Emma Caldwell's client list and discovered from her phone a range of clients from different fields, bankers, students, priests, and even a police officer. As they delved into this, secrets hidden from spouses and employers were exposed by the police's relentless questioning. One particular client, Bakir Anku, was the last person to contact Emma on the night she disappeared. Her final phone signal was traced to a Turkish cafe. The police raided the establishment after they found many sex workers had been paid there for their services. Inside, two spots of Emma's blood were found on some bedding. They believed that the blood could have various origins, which suggested possible violence or other activities in the cafe. The investigation expanded its scope as they heard disturbing accounts from other Glasgow sex workers. These testimonies painted a grim picture of the dangers these women faced. They detailed some very terrifying experiences and pervasive threats that lurked within the city. Stories of leaving hair in clients' car for safety, dropping condoms after sex, being fearful of attacks, and horrible experiences at the Turkish cafe emerged. Despite the place being bugged for two years and thousands of conversations recorded, no admission of guilt in Emma's murder was obtained from the men working there. Arrests were made, but the case collapsed due to a lack of evidence, which marked it as a significant failure in the investigation. Investigators looked closely at a different person, a 32-year-old man named Lane Packer, with similar rugged behavior caught their attention. He seemed important due to his connections with the community and his prior associations. 
Packer's network included frequent interactions with individuals known within Glasgow's red light district, including sex workers and others linked to the area. Witnesses provided chilling accounts, and people who saw things told stories that seemed to connect him to places similar to where Emma was found dead. His repeated interactions with the authorities and troubling history raised suspicion. The investigation into Emma Caldwell's death faced many challenges and the real truth stay hidden. They checked details and clues and put in a lot of effort to solve the mystery. In the pursuit of answers in Emma Caldwell's case, five individuals were placed under scrutiny. Among them, the most notable suspect was Lane Packer. Packer, a reoccurring client of Emma's, emerged as a central figure due to his frequent interactions with her. A number of sex workers stated their discomfort with his reoccurring appearances with Emma and used to consider him to be a suspicious individual. Their vivid recollections narrated incidences of cohesion, rage-filled outbursts, and aggressive behavior, often in secluded woodland areas, similar to where Emma's body was discovered. Apart from Packer, attention was also directed towards four other men, Hussein Kobanaglu, 63, Halil Kandil, 42, Abuker Onaku, 39, and Mustafa Solimez, 44, who were initially charged with Emma's murder in 2007. However, within a year the case collapsed due to police and prosecution errors, which left the investigation in disarray. Packer avoided charges, which led to a costly £4 million investigation named Operation Guard. Translated transcripts were disputed, and surveillance recordings lacked clear evidence. Later, in 2015, a reinvestigation was ordered, which revealed the unauthorized seizure of phone data from whistleblowers. Only one conviction through a retrial marks a bleak outcome among the seven murders investigated. Lane Packer, born in 1973, was a frequent client of Emma Caldwell's and became a major suspect in the reinvestigation. Fox workers reported that Packer had a troubling habit of taking them to secluded wooded areas similar to where Emma's body was found. He faces accusations of 45 other offenses, including 11 counts of alleged cases of abduction, indecent assault, sexual assault involving multiple women. The charges also involve three men and one boy, aged 15 at the time, listed as victims of alleged assaults. Additionally, he is accused of lewd or inappropriate behavior towards a girl aged 14 or 15. Witness accounts painted a troubling picture. Describing coercion, angry outbursts, and aggressive behavior consistent with Packer's behavior. One specific incident, involving accusations of behind billboards, added a sinister layer to the suspicions surrounding him. As the investigation unfolded, Packer shifted from denial to admitting multiple interactions with Emma during an interview with a journalist. Despite acknowledging being present in the woods on several occasions, he vehemently denied any involvement in her tragic death. However, his troubled past marked by a record of violence against women and a conviction for throttling his ex-partner raised alarming concerns. Lane Packer, at 50 years old, now in 2023, is facing serious charges. Firstly, Beyond his association with Emma Caldwell's case, Packer faced serious charges, including 11 counts of that span a significant 26-year period. These allegations mark a disturbing pattern of behavior that extends far beyond the tragedy that surrounds Emma's death. Moreover, Packer's involvement in assaulting his former girlfriend, Zadine Bolton, in Clarkston Airdrie between November 1st and November 30th, 2018, led to his arrest in November. The incidents included physical harm with Packer, pushing her onto a bed and choking her. This resulted in his subsequent sentencing. Lane Packer received a two-year prison sentence and a five-year non-harassment order for assaulting his former partner. He faced charges in Emma Caldwell's murder, along with 45 other offenses. Packer pleaded not guilty to all charges, and an 11-week trial is scheduled to start in January 2024. In essence, these developments further deepen the complexities that surround Packer's character, highlighting a past with a string of criminal offenses, 
which could potentially intersect with the investigation into Emma Caldwell's untimely demise. Emma Caldwell's tragic story wasn't just about her own struggles. It was about a family left shattered by her untimely demise. For her mother, Margaret Caldwell, and her late father, William Caldwell, Emma's loss cut deeper than words could convey. They were parents who held onto the hope night after night during her disappearance, their hearts gripped by the anguish of uncertainty. Margaret, who found peace in simple acts like doing her daughter's laundry, spoke volumes about a mother's enduring care, no matter what the situation. The Caldwell family's tireless pursuit of justice was a testament to a mother's love that refused to yield. Margaret's relentless campaigning and her belief in her daughter's story fueled the ongoing investigations and breathed life into a case that demanded closure. Margaret's campaigning went beyond seeking justice for her daughter, Emma. It was a resolute fight for truth and accountability within a system that sometimes overlooked the most vulnerable. Emma Caldwell's life took a tragic turn due to drugs and exploitation by evil individuals. Her story reflects the harsh reality of how addiction can lead someone down a dangerous path. Exploited by manipulative figures, Emma's vulnerability became a cycle of hardship that ended in tragedy. Emma's tale serves as a reminder of life's fragility and the impact of circumstances beyond our control. As we conclude Emma's story, it serves as a somber reflection on the challenging paths life can take amid grief, drugs, and addiction. Christmas lights twinkled against the frosted cityscape, yet an unnatural chill hung in the air on December 25, 2016, in Washington, D.C. On that day, 46-year-old actress Trisha Lynn McCauley slipped into her car, bound for a festive dinner with friends. But Trisha never arrived. An echo of unease settled among her loved ones, escalating into a frantic search that dragged on for almost 48 agonizing hours. Then, on the 27th, like a cruel Christmas present, came the news Trisha's body was discovered in the heart of Washington, D.C. Did Trisha take her own life, or is there a darker story hidden behind the scenes of that perplexing night? Trisha Lynn McCauley was born in West Suffolk, England, on February 25, 1970, to Henry and Sue McCauley. She grew up in different places, including Arizona, Alabama, West Springfield, Virginia, Louisiana, and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. She completed her high school education at Socrates High School in 1988, and later in 1992, she graduated from American University. She further pursued her studies and earned a master's degree in herbal medicine from Maryland University of Integrative Health. In the 1980s, Trisha moved to Washington, D.C. There she became a bright actress known for her excellent performances on stage and screen. Her most notable roles include playing Maxine in The Paper Girl in 2000, serving as a stand-in for Gina Dewan Tatum in Step Up in 2006, and being cast as Charlotte and Never Dream The Beginning in 2012. Trisha didn't just act in movies. She also took part in local theater shows, did commercials, and worked as a supervisor at the Maryland University of Integrative Health. Trisha taught acting at Imagination Stage, a children's theater in Bethesda, Maryland, and Roundhouse Theater in Silver Spring. She also enjoyed mentoring new actors, and when not on stage, she worked as a nutritionist and a yoga teacher at the Yoga District on First Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. Her interests weren't confined to the performing arts. She also had cultivated a thriving garden at a local city farm and would often share her homegrown vegetables with her community. Those fortunate enough to know Trisha describe her as more than a luminous actress. She embodied kindness, gentleness, and a spirit of generosity that left an indelible mark on everyone she met. Her commitment to both the arts and the well-being of others paints a vibrant picture of a person whose influence extended far beyond the silver screen. Trisha's life took an unexpected turn on December 25, 2016. She was preparing for a dinner gathering with her theater friends later that evening. Little did anyone know that this joyous occasion 
would soon be overshadowed by an unforeseen tragedy. At 4.30 p.m., Trisha shared on Facebook her excitement about going to the dinner. All set for the evening, she had also prepared for a trip to visit family the following day. With her belongings packed and anticipation in the air, Trisha hopped into her small, white Toyota Scion. She soon hit the road and headed for her destination. However, Trisha never reached the party. When Trisha didn't show up, her friends tried calling her. As she had missed previous gatherings by falling asleep, her friends assumed it might have happened again. But when she didn't catch her flight on December 26th, they got worried and reported her missing to the Metropolitan Police Department. Her loved ones launched a social media campaign to find her. The idea of someone disappearing on Christmas Day struck a chord, and people rallied to help. Friends searched the route she would have taken to dinner. The police also checked her apartment, but they found no sign of a struggle or forced entry. Everyone was determined to find her and bring her back to her family safely. Investigators soon found hope when they saw that Trisha's bank cards had been used. However, a somber realization set in when reports surfaced of an unidentified man was spotted behind the wheel of her car. To aid their efforts, the police released a photo of the mysterious man, captured from CCTV footage, seeking assistance from the public in identifying him. The unknown man became the prime suspect in the investigation. It was around midnight on December 27, 2016, when a man named Jonathan Paget, accompanied by his dog near DuPont Circle, found himself in an unexpected turn of events. As he strolled, a critical missing person alert for Trisha lit up on his cell phone, showcasing images of both Trisha's car and the suspected individual. Although Jonathan initially brushed it off, fate intervened strangely. To his surprise, Trisha's vehicle was parked along the street where he walked his dog. Inside, a man was smoking and blaring loud music. There was the car, and there was the guy sitting there in the car, and he was, um, he was smoking something. It seemed like a large kind of cigar or something. It didn't seem like a cigarette, but something, you know, substantial. And he had the music uh, cranked up like full volume, and he's like bouncing around in the car. Oddly, the man confronted Jonathan with an angry inquiry about how he was doing before abruptly driving away. He leans out the window and goes, Hello, sir, how are you? And I just, I mean, I really sort of, I, I froze up, but I didn't freeze, you know, because I, I just realized instantaneously something's going down and it's not good. <laughs> and I have to do something. I have to do something effective. And so uh, we step up on the sidewalk. I've got my phone. I'm like, well, I'm fine, sir. How are you? What does he do at that point? He whips out onto P Street, does a U, and goes south on 21st. As the car zoomed off, Jonathan glimpsed the license plate number, which matched the one featured in the alert he had just received. With alarm bells ringing in his mind, Jonathan wasted no time and promptly dialed the police to relay the crucial information. This unexpected encounter would become a pivotal moment in the unfolding search for Trisha. Upon the arrival of the officers from the Metropolitan Police Department, Trisha's car was discovered a few blocks away, parked outside a CVS store, in the 2200 block of M Street. Entering the store, the officers identified the suspect as 29-year-old Dwayne Johnson. He was arrested on a minor assault charge from an earlier altercation that same day. When officers searched him, they found Trisha's car keys in his pocket. After collecting the key and unlocking the vehicle, the officers were met with a harrowing scene. Trisha's lifeless body was concealed between the rear and front seats, her legs bound with a seat belt. Johnson was promptly arrested and charged with second-degree theft and simple assault. During his arrest, there were injuries on his hands and jaw. On the same day, Trisha's lifeless body was discovered. Her heartbroken brother, Brian McCauley, took to social media with a poignant post. Trisha is gone. They have found her body, he wrote. He also expressed gratitude for the collective efforts, support, and love extended by all. Brian acknowledged Trisha's deep appreciation for them and thanked them for standing by her throughout the years. 
While the city reveled in Christmas festivities, Trisha's friends and families gathered for a somber vigil. On the evening of December 27th, a group of friends convened at a DC yoga studio to honor Trisha's memory. Such was the turnout that the studio had to keep the front door open to accommodate those who wanted to participate. The usual Tuesday yoga class at the Yoga District on 1st Street Northwest transformed into a memorial for the beloved 46-year-old instructor. The collective grief of Trisha's friends turned the yoga session into a touching tribute as they came together to remember and celebrate her life. The investigation into Trisha's tragic demise commenced with earnest efforts to uncover the circumstances surrounding her death. The details of how she passed away remained unknown, leaving Johnson as the key figure who could shed light on the matter. According to Johnson's account to the police, he claimed to have met Trisha around Christmas when she offered him a ride. He asserted that she initiated an intimate encounter which took place on a curb somewhere. Johnson further told the police that after this encounter, Trisha became despondent and expressed a desire to end her own life. Johnson's version continued, stating that Trisha hanged herself inside her car, though he couldn't specify the means she used for this act. Strangely, he asserted that Trisha gave him permission to use her car, money, and credit cards following this distressing incident. In a disturbing revelation to the police, Johnson admitted to picking up a and driving around the city with Trisha's lifeless body in the back seat. When questioned about this appalling action, he claimed he thought Trisha was merely sleeping and would eventually wake up. Curiously, Johnson couldn't provide an explanation for the injuries observed on his hands and jaw during his apprehension. Investigators soon discovered that Johnson was homeless and living on the streets. A few weeks earlier, he was arrested for stealing electric toothbrushes from a pharmacy. However, due to a lack of witnesses, he was released with a restraining order to stay away from the store. Although he was supposed to have a GPS tracker fitted to his ankle, it didn't happen as he didn't show up, and no one followed up on it. Based on Johnson's story, it seemed Trisha had tragically ended her own life. However, his account raised questions, and despite no evidence against him, suspicion lingered. If Trisha had indeed taken her own life, the reason remained a painful mystery, shrouded in the shadows of her final moments. Following an autopsy, a dramatic turn of events unfolded. Johnson was charged with first-degree murder. The autopsy revealed that Trisha died from asphyxia due to ligature strangulation with blunt force trauma. New information now on a Washington, D.C. yoga instructor found dead in her car. D.C. police have charged 29-year-old Adrian Dwayne Johnson with her murder. Additionally, Trisha had a broken nose, which raised major flags regarding the manner of her death. Despite the charges, Johnson maintained his innocence, asserting that Trisha had taken her own life and had no involvement in her death. Despite his claims, he remained in custody as the legal proceedings unfolded. In September 2017, Johnson had a change of heart and to everyone's surprise, admitted his guilt in murdering Trisha. His defense highlighted Johnson's ongoing struggle with mental illness throughout the years. According to them, the combination of drug and alcohol addiction had pushed him to a life on the streets, making him susceptible to police scrutiny. Despite these challenges, it became evident that he had exploited Trisha's innate kindness. After Johnson's admission, the police pieced together the events leading to Trisha's tragic end. They believed that on December 25, 2016, as Trisha set out from her home in the 2000 block of North Capitol Street Northwest to attend the holiday party at a friend's house in Washington, D.C., she had met Johnson. He entered her car and assaulted her shortly afterward. Trisha had fought back, kicking and punching him. This struggle resulted in Trisha's clothing being torn, and she suffered a fractured nose. During the altercation, Johnson took the scarf Trisha was wearing. Using it as a ligature to tighten around her neck muscles, this had caused her death. In November 2017, Judge Hiram Puig Lugo sentenced Johnson to 30 years in prison as part of a plea deal. In addition to the prison sentence without the possibility of early release, 
Johnson would also be placed on a lifetime of supervised release. During the sentencing announcement, U.S. Attorney Jesse Liu and Chief Newsham praised the dedicated efforts of the officers, detectives, and others from the Metropolitan Police Department who diligently investigated the case. They also expressed gratitude for the support provided by the U.S. Park Service, the FBI's Cellular Analysis Survey Team, and the District of Columbia Department of Forensic Sciences. Additionally, they acknowledged the commendable work of those within the U.S. Attorney's Office who handled the case, recognizing the collaborative efforts that contributed to bringing justice to Trisha's tragic situation. Trisha's family shared their feelings of loss and revealed that they now feel afraid in the city where they once felt secure. Friends discussed undergoing grief counseling and highlighted the significant impact Trisha's death had on the theater community. The aftermath of this tragic story prompted a broader conversation about mental health awareness and the importance of supporting those in need. It challenges us now, you know, to, to try to stay in the light and celebrate her great spirit and not dwell too much on the pain and the darkness. We'll never be the same, but it's still worth it having known her. Trisha is remembered through a garden named after her and a fund helping theater professionals with health insurance. Despite the senseless tragedy of her death on Christmas Day, her legacy inspires others to embrace the community she deeply loved. Trisha's final act continues to have a positive impact, fostering unity and support within the community she cherished. As we conclude Trisha's story, the shadow of Johnson's actions looms emphasizing the importance of addressing mental health challenges and fostering a community that prioritizes support and understanding. What do you think transpired on the day of her tragic murder? Was it a result of Johnson's struggles with mental illness, or do you believe there were other factors at play? On October 23, 2023, the life of Deshay Stevenson a 35-year-old influencer and business owner took a tragic turn. She vanished without a trace, leaving her paralyzed mother and a 17-year-old daughter, Maya, behind. As the night stretched on, desperate for answers, Maya reached out to her aunt, who was well-versed in criminal justice. Their search led them to Deshay's car, abandoned near a relative's house. But Maya's aunt noticed something about the car. Then... In the early hours of October 25, 2023, a local news website reported a woman's body was found just minutes from the relative's home in Pleasant Village Housing Complex. The family called the police, desperately hoping that the victim wasn't Deshay. But tragically, their worst fear came true. Deshay's body was found on the side of Murdoch Road, just three minutes away from the Lincoln Memorial Cemetery in Dallas, Texas. Deshay was lying lifeless, with a single gunshot wound to her chest. Blood stained the ground around her, showing the violence she suffered. With one shoe missing, the scene became even more unsettling, leaving unanswered questions about her final moments. This brings us to the question, what dark secret led to Deshay's brutal end? Was it someone known or a stranger waiting in the shadows? Deshay Stevenson was born on November 16, 1988. She was raised in a tight-knit family in Dallas, Texas. The warmth and guidance she received from her family, especially her mother, instilled in her a lot of values of hard work and self-sufficiency, starting from an early age. After she completed her education at Atlanta High School, Deshay entered the business world. She was born to be an entrepreneur and always came up with the most creative business ideas. Business for Deshay wasn't just passion. She also recognized it as a means to secure both her own and her family's financial well-being. She explored various business ventures initially, and she finally found her niche in retail clothing and accessories. This not only proved to be more profitable, but it also brought her a deep sense of fulfillment. In the early stages, she operated from her apartment, then gradually expanded her merchandise to include men's clothing, handbags, eyelashes, and more. She named her store brand Shea Money Purses and more. Responding to the increasing demand, she progressed from a small storefront to a larger space in May 2022. Throughout her journey, Deshay had her sister Jasmine Stevenson as a steadfast companion who helped her achieve significant milestones. 
Deshay completed her tax course in 2021. After this, she aligned herself with unlimited taxes and more. This helped her to broaden her business expertise. Fueled by ambition and a keen business sense, Deshay consistently worked to improve her financial status, showcasing her clothing pieces on social media to boost sales. Undeniably destined for success, she had merely scratched the surface of her potential. Alongside her thriving business pursuits, Deshay also played the role of a loving mother to her 17-year-old daughter, Maya, who held a special place in her heart. Maya was not just her daughter, she was Deshay's entire world. Additionally, she cared for her mother, who unfortunately suffered a stroke and faced partial paralysis. Despite these challenges, Deshay's expansive heart radiated love, fearlessly sharing her time, money, and cherished possessions with those closest to her. She was outgoing. She was outspoken. Um, very energetic. She gonna tell you how she feel. You know what I'm saying? She's not gonna keep no secrets from you. If she feel the type of way, she gonna tell you. Love family, like, top tier. Family oriented, like, it's all about her family, it's all about her husband, it's, 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 it's this type of person she was. That's why she had so much love, because when Dashe came, like, you felt her energy in the room. She made an impact everywhere she went. Everybody knew her. Deshae later found herself falling in love with a man named Michael Smith, a.k.a. Miracle Measy. And just like she did to everyone she loved, Deshae showered him with love, too. After a few years of being in a relationship, Deshae was set to marry the guy of her dreams. For her, Michael Smith was not just a good husband, but a good son-in-law and a great stepfather. She already considered him a family member. Then, on May 24, 2021, they tied the knot at a courthouse. Later, on September 11, 2022, they had a grand wedding reception. What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? My place. My life. My life. God save you. God save you. In the name. In the name. Of the Godfather. Of the Godfather. Of the Son of Jesus Christ. And the Son of Jesus Christ. The power of the Deshay was so in love, she even made him a part of her daughter's life. She went the extra mile by celebrating him on Father's Day, offering warm wishes for a happy stepfather's day. Come on. Everybody wants to read the book. Earlier on October 24th, 2023, Deshay had dropped her daughter, Maya, off at her grand aunt's house and planned to pick her up later. However, as it approached midnight and Maya had been unsuccessfully trying to reach her mom since 4 p.m., worry set in. Unable to get in touch with Deshay, Maya reached out to her aunt Jasmine, but received no response. Concerned, she then called her uncle's girlfriend, Ashton, Despite Ashton picking up, they couldn't reach her mom. Worried and unable to locate her, Maya's aunt and uncle decided to meet up and investigate. They searched through the night. Then, in the early morning of October 25th, 2023, they found Deshay's abandoned car at the Pleasant Village housing complex, where Michael's father resided. Monitoring news, they discovered a post that reported a woman's body being found near a cemetery, just three minutes away from where they were. They rushed to the location and saw Deshay's clothing, and they felt like their worst fears were about to come true. The family informed the police about Deshay's disappearance and mentioned a car where she might have been last seen. Then the police quickly checked nearby cameras. Now, this is where the unbelievable happens. The footage revealed Deshay and Michael's cars arriving simultaneously. Deshay exited her car and entered Michael's, where they appeared to be engaged in a heated discussion. The car then drove off. Then within minutes, Deshay was found lifeless with a gunshot wound to her chest and pronounced dead. The growing suspicion among everyone 
was centered on whether Michael, the man Deshay cared for deeply, could be the perpetrator. Authorities secured a search warrant for Michael's home, and here's when they uncovered his car outside his house, with blood on the passenger seat, a bullet shell casing, and a sandal matching the one Deshay wore when discovered. In the house search, multiple guns were discovered, but Michael was nowhere to be found. He was later found and arrested at a barber shop, where he confessed to officers about being under the influence of PCP, a dissociative drug that includes hallucinations and distorts a person's sense of sight, sound, and overall reality. Subsequent testing confirmed his claim. It's worth noting that Michael had openly discussed using PCP on online platforms before. Michael Smith had a tough childhood. It was marked by a considerable turmoil and he lacked a stable and secure home. He navigated the challenges of life on his own, with an uneasy relationship with his father that still lingered. His early years were shaped by the harsh realities of the streets, where he hustled and fought for survival. The combination of street life and a challenging home environment molded him into the person he became, a narcissist. Tragically, Deshay found herself entangled in a love story with him, who clearly was the wrong man for her. Since the day Deshay met Michael, her actions seemed to orbit around him, with every decision and effort seemingly tethered to his presence in her life. Unfamiliar with the concept of love, Michael proved incapable of reciprocating affection. Deshay showered upon him. Their love story began in 2014, and Deshay, really in love and wanting it to last forever, was deeply invested in their relationship. However, in 2016, Michael encountered legal troubles that led to his arrest, conviction, and a five-year prison sentence. This unexpected turn put Deshay's dreams of a lasting future with him on indefinite hold. Undaunted by the challenges, Deshay remained patient, visiting Michael regularly during his prison term. As fate would have it, Michael was set to be released on May 17, 2021. Displaying unconditional love and commitment, Deshay eagerly went to pick him up from prison, ready to continue their journey despite the hurdles they had faced. Deshay always made sure that he was a part of every aspect of her life, to the point where she even brought him along on her mother-daughter hangouts. Deshay devoted herself to taking care of her husband, and slowly he also started to enjoy the comfort and continued to rely on her. Going the extra mile, she purchased a house to move her daughter from a challenging neighborhood. Notably, she made this decision weeks before Michael's release from prison, suggesting a timeline that was more about both her daughter and her husband rather than solely her daughter. Deshay was expected to leave him at his parents' house after picking him up from prison. Instead, she chose to bring him home and marry him. Like, the whole time he was incarcerated, she stayed down. She, she took on all the responsibility by herself. You know, even when he came, like everything was mapped out. She had everything planned for them. She waited for that day to marry him. Michael was picked up from prison on May 17, 2021. And within a mere seven days, on May 24, 2021, they exchanged vows at the courthouse. The decision to marry was taken by Deshay after she bought rings for both of them and was eagerly awaiting to be husband and wife officially. Later, on September 11, 2022, she arranged a luxury wedding. Deshay covered all the expenses, even for the clothes and shoes he wore on their special day. Since then, she took on the responsibility of providing for him in every aspect, clothing, feeding, housing, whining and dining, vacationing and romancing. He too craved her undivided attention and appeared in most of her videos online where she showed him off as an outstanding husband. The motive was for others to admire him and perceive him as significant. From an external perspective, without any doubt, they appeared to be the perfect couple. She placed him above herself and she knew it. As it started becoming a reoccurring theme, he started to take advantage of her. Where they found the body at, we were so close. It's like, damn, like, father got there couple minutes early, even if she was suffering, I wish I, you know, 
But you know, you can't make a person leave somebody that they love. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, when a person loves somebody they love them, you gotta let them, you know, leave when they ready. Well, does Shay on the outside look like a very confident woman? It was limited to her capacity to earn and provide. Inwardly, her self-assurance was lacking. He exploited this vulnerability and played on her emotions. That anything was going wrong in her, her marriage? Yeah, of course. Um, you see signs, but don't nobody just want to give up like that. You know what I'm saying? So, and she wanted her marriage to be perfect. You know, everybody wants that perfect marriage, that one-time marriage, and she 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 did her big one. Like I can honestly say, like she was a, she was a perfect wife for him. He just wasn't ready for what she was ready for. And sometimes that be that be the hard part. She thought she could change him because he was a street dude. So she thought she could change him. You know, she was raised in the street a little bit too. But as a female, like it's different than being a man and raised in the street. Nobody paid much attention to them until Michael Smith's Facebook post emerged on July 17, 2021, where he expressed gratitude for her love and stated, Despite the challenges, our future is promised, so keep overlooking the obstacles and focus on our true love. The simplicity of the statement now reveals the manipulative mindset at play. This 2021 post provided a glimpse of what life could have been like with someone like them. However, in 2023, Deshay finally opens up. On September 27, 2023, Deshay shared a Facebook post that expressed sentiments like, I'm mentally at a place where I can't afford to freely give anymore. Meaning, if I love you, I need for you to love me back. If I care about you, I need for you to care about me too. If I sacrifice for you, I need sacrifices in return. If I protect you, I need to be protected as well. My mental capacity won't allow me to keep pouring from an empty cup. I can't afford to accept one-sided love and energy anymore. We all deserve to be poured into as we pour into others. Then later on October 14th, 2023, she posted saying, Sometimes you gotta blame yourself because you knew better. Deshay attempted to reason with Michael about treating her right, sparking a sudden fear in his mind about the possibility of her leaving him. On October 24th, 2023, after days of discussions, Michael proposed a meeting at his father's housing complex. Before the meeting, he had used PCP as a coping mechanism, like he always did for serious matters. Despite Deshay's initial hesitation, she was convinced to agree due to narcissistic manipulation. Upon arriving, she entered his car, where he passionately pleaded with her to give him a chance, repeating promises from the past months. As they drove away, she grew concerned about their destination. In a desolate area far from people, Michael pulled out a gun, aimed it at her chest, and shot her. Afterward, he pulled over and pushed her from the car. Unaware that one sandal got left behind in his car, he drove home, parked, and took a walk. Later, he ended up at his barbershop. Meanwhile, Deshay's daughter, Maya, tried to reach her, but received no response. After the horrifying incident, they discovered Deshay lying lifeless on the side of the road. I, I really don't even have the words because my cousin she had she had a she had a load, you know what I mean? Like boys taking care of my aunt, you know, she paralyzed. She got one daughter that's in high school, graduating next year that she'll never be able to see. And she strives so hard to get where she was at, and it's just like I don't even know. She worked so hard to get what she was at and just to see everything get took from her and her daughter not be able to, you know, carry on, it's, it's, it's hard. This was the woman who had once showered him with a world of luxurious love, treating him far more generously than he deserved. Yet he callously discarded her from the car, leaving her abandoned on the roadside. Even to Shay's family, who cared a lot, couldn't see that he was toxic. He acted in a way that hid his harmful side, making it difficult for anyone to notice the harm he could cause. That, like, did this catch you guys off, off guard? He caught us off guard because he was so quiet. He was so laid back. Like, he was sweet in front of us, but behind closed doors, I just feel like he was a monster. And it, it hurt me more because it's a domestic violence case. 
My mama lost her legs five years ago to a domestic violent case. So she don't, she'll never be able to walk again. And to see my cousin go through the same thing and she not make it out, it's hard. Following the arrest, he asserted to the officers that he was under the influence of PCP when he committed the murder. Michael Smith, age 39, was apprehended later that day and is facing charges of murder. Currently, Smith is held at the Dallas County Jail with the bail set at $1 million. DeShay Stevenson's story is undeniably tragic. While the exact motive behind her murder remains unclear, Michael Smith's apparent disinterest in the videos and DeShay's constant boasting about pampering him raise questions, and it seemed like DeShay appeared to live more in the online world than in the real one. The motive behind the shooting remains unclear. Was it linked to just drugs or perhaps ego? The confusion deepens when considering why someone would harm a partner known for their generosity and love. DeShay's extravagant gifts and surprises beyond average dreams make this situation even more mysterious. Now, all we have is the aftermath of a shattered family and distressed business. As this vibrant businesswoman and local influencer, the life of the party has left an irreplaceable void. We hope you found the video informative. Leave a comment below suggesting the next case you'd like us to explore. Remember to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to Mysterious Hook. Your encouragement inspires us to produce captivating content for you. Until next time, stay curious. In the 1960s, Newcastle, England was in the midst of major urban changes. Old rundown buildings were torn down to make way for newer, more modern homes and apartments. Amidst this upheaval, on May 25, 1968, came the shocking discovery of the lifeless body of four-year-old Martin Brown. Just two months later, on July 31st, another tragedy struck when three-year-old Brian Howe's body was found, scarred with disturbing wounds in a nearby wasteland. What made these cases even more chilling was the presence of 11-year-old Mary Bell at both the scenes. Constantly smiling and seemingly enjoying the unfolding investigation, what exactly happened with Martin and Brian? What factors may have contributed to Mary Bell's disturbing behavior, and was she really connected to both the murders? Mary Bell was born on May 26, 1957, in Newcastle, England, and grew up in Scotswood, a neighborhood frozen in time since the war. It was a tough place, full of social problems due to years of neglect. Violent crimes were common, and the White House Road area, where Mary lived, had high unemployment. The streets were always busy with police due to drug activity, sex work, and domestic abuse. Mary lived in such a neighborhood where almost every other house was occupied by a prostitute. Her childhood was far from happy, as she didn't get much attention and love that every child deserves from her parents who, in her case, were often absent. Her mom, Elizabeth McCricket, also known as Betty Bell, and a sex worker, was just 17 when Mary was born. In fact, the first thing she said when Mary came into the world was, take that thing away from me. Though Mary's biological father remained a mystery throughout, shortly after she was born, her mother married Billy Bell, who was not an ordinary man. He was an armed robber, a lifelong criminal, and a struggling alcoholic. So, from the get-go, Mary didn't have the most nurturing environment. The family resided in a perpetually filthy house, located at 70 White House Road in Scottswood. Betty always struggled to connect with Mary. Not wanting her was one thing, but subjecting her to daily abuse and beating her was another. Betty just craved attention and was always causing drama while Mary longed for the love and support every kid deserves from their parents. But all she got was mistreatment and violence. If you thought that Betty just stopped there, then maybe you were wrong, because her mistreatment towards Mary went far beyond any mother would ever do. It wasn't just the typical abuse one might expect, but something darker was at play in Mary's life. One significant early influence on Mary was Betty's profession. She was a prostitute selling services, which often involved sadomasochism. As time went on, Mary also disclosed her participation in the scenarios Betty acted out with her clients. 
Mary was treated like a prop and was told by her mother that they were just plain blind man's bluff. In reality, Mary was just growing up in circumstances where she was being physically abused. Just imagine how disturbing and dirty it must have been for Mary to be exposed to such situations. She faced countless challenges at a young age, situations that would give anyone nightmares. However, she found some comfort in befriending an older girl. Sadly, this friendship ended up fueling Mary's inner dark thoughts and actions, which led to a drastic change in her personality. In 1968, Mary became friends with her next-door neighbor, Norma Bell. Norma, who was two years older, had a youthful appearance with pretty features and mannerisms that made her seem childlike. Mary and Norma became fast friends, but their friendship brought out a darker side in both of them. They started causing trouble in the neighborhood and often fantasized about living a wild, on-the-run lifestyle like characters in a Western movie. They even dreamed about the police trying to stop them. It seemed like they spurred each other on to push the boundaries further than they would have had they been alone. Sometimes these daydreams could be enjoyable, but they could also take a darker turn. For Mary and Norma, their daydreams involved themes like violence, power, and escape scenarios. These intense daydreams became a problem for the girls because they were so immersive, and they were often accompanied by repetitive movements or expressions. Mary and Norma's friendship went from causing mischief to committing petty crimes together. However, their activities didn't go unnoticed by the law. Former Chief Inspector Peter Moore stepped in and brought the girls to justice. He became the first detective to secure a conviction for Mary Bell. While investigating a minor crime involving theft at a gas meter in a building near Scottswood, Inspector Moore inadvertently ended up apprehending Mary and Norma in connection with the case. He was surprised by how street smart Mary was during the interview, especially in front of her mother, Betty. Every time he asked Mary a question, she simply replied with, no comments, leaving him in disbelief that a 10-year-old girl could speak to a police officer like that. Both girls, Mary and Norma, faced charges of theft and admitted guilt. Despite their young age, they were conditionally discharged, meaning they were left off with certain conditions, since it was their first offense and they were both under 16. But just when everyone thought things couldn't get worse and they might have put an end to their mischievous ways, Mary and Norma's actions took a dark turn from stealing to outright violence. They weren't content with just petty theft anymore, but started engaging in more disturbing behavior. It was as if they had crossed a line from where they couldn't turn back. On May 11, 1968, the parents of three young girls contacted the police, reporting that Mary and Norma had tried to strangle their children while they were playing in a sandpit. Three little girls, Pauline, age seven, Susan, and Cindy, both six, were having fun playing in the sandpit at Woodlands Crescent Daycare when Mary unexpectedly attacked them. Out of nowhere, Mary approached them, grabbed Pauline, and began strangling her while trying to force sand into her mouth. Norma pinned us down, and Mary had grabbed us by the neck and stopped, like, strangling us. And then she was, had a hand here, and she was getting the sand and then pouring at my mouth. And I couldn't go in quick enough and she tried to stuff her fingers down, basically, to get it further down. And obviously I was terrified. And I think Norma was a little bit frightened when she seen what Mary was doing, because Norma jumped up. And by that time, she had jumped up and I managed to struggle and get free and run home. After attacking Pauline, Mary didn't stop there. She moved on to Susan and then to Cindy. What's even scarier was she asked Cindy a chilling question about what would happen if someone got choked, and then without even waiting for her to answer, she actually started choking her. Cindy apparently turned purple during the attack, and Pauline had marks on her throat for three days. Despite the evidence and complaints from the mothers, no actions were taken against Mary and Norma. Why did Mary engage in such violent behavior, and why wasn't anything done to stop it? But what was about to unfold next was even more frightening. If actions had been taken against Mary earlier, perhaps it could have been prevented. During the 1960s urban makeover, some families still lived in buildings set for demolition, waiting to be relocated by the council. One such area was a large wasteland near a railway line, nicknamed Tin Lizzie by local kids. 
in this area on May 25, 1968, at around 3.30 p.m. Three young boys were out searching for scrap wood when they stumbled upon something horrifying in a derelict house at number 85 on St. Margaret's Road in Scottswood. They discovered four-year-old Martin Brown lying on his back in the abandoned house. He had his arms outstretched, blood coming from his head, and saliva drooling from his mouth. Thankfully, there were some workers nearby who were working just down the road. Being in panic, the boys quickly called out to them for help. One of the workmen, Gordon Collinson, rushed to call an ambulance, while the other, John Hall, tried to give CPR to Martin. As they worked to save Martin's life, a large crowd gathered at the scene. As soon as Martin's mother, June Richardson, heard the news, she hurried to the scene and stood there in shock, watching the man desperately trying to resuscitate Martin. Deep down, she already felt the painful truth. Her little boy was gone, and tears streamed down her face as she faced this heartbreaking reality. Strangely, there were no signs of a struggle, and Martin's body showed no visible injuries. Because of the mysterious circumstances surrounding his discovery, the police were called in to investigate. The cause of death they initially considered was quite unusual. At first, I thought it might, maybe some tablets, but that's just because there were some tablets lying around. The previous tenant of the house, which was then empty, had left these tablets around the floor. The, the pathologist carried out an extensive examination of the boy's throat, but couldn't uh, come to the conclusion that it was violent or, or uh, uh, not other than a natural death. After the post-mortem, several theories emerged explaining Martin's mysterious death. Some speculated that he may have climbed into the top of the stairs, but became too scared to come back down due to a previous fall when he was younger. This could have put him in a state of shock. Another theory suggested that he may have ingested pills, which could have led to his death. However, no conclusive evidence was found to determine the exact cause. As a result, the police concluded that Martin's death was an accident and attributed it to natural causes. Two days later, on Monday, May 27, 1968, police were called to a nursery near Mary and Norma Bell's homes in Scottwood, as the nursery had been broken into and vandalized. Upon entering the premises, they found tiles ripped off the roof, books scattered, desks overturned, and ink smeared everywhere. What caught their attention were four separate notes taking responsibility for Martin Brown's murder. One note chillingly stated, I murder so that I may come back. Another note crudely read, We did murder Martin Brown. Off, you bastard. A third note simply said, Off, we murdered him. Watch out, Fanny and Faggot. The final note was the most cryptic, reading, You are mice. Why? Because we murdered Martin Brown. You better look out. There are murderers about. Fanny and Ald Faggot, you screws. There was something strange about those letters, as they were filled with spelling mistakes grammatical errors, and sloppy handwriting. It seemed like they were written by a child. Since Martin's death was ruled an accident, authorities brushed off the letters as a silly prank, pulled by some kid. Over the few weeks after Martin's death, Mary frequently visited his home to chat with his mother, June. Despite the somber atmosphere, Mary would ask insensitive questions, like how June was coping, and if she missed Martin, and so on. What made these interactions unsettling was Mary's demeanor. She maintained a constant smile and giggle throughout. At one point, Mary even asked to see Martin, to which June gently reminded her that she couldn't see him because he was already deceased. Up until that moment, June had been under the impression that Mary was innocent. However, her perspective shifted drastically when Mary uttered the chilling words, I know he's dead. I want to see him in the coffin. The way Mary stood there, smiling as she said it, sent a shiver down June's spine. It was a moment that made June question everything she thought she knew about Mary. Unable to comprehend Mary's actions, June eventually closed the door on her face as her behavior was undeniably creepy. As the summer passed in Newcastle without any further incidents, the memory of Martin Brown's case lingered. With no clear cause of death, People started to attribute that his passing was because of the hazardous living conditions in the slums. The local community was so outraged by the lack of progress in Martin's case that they took to the streets to voice their dissatisfaction with how the authorities were handling the situation. Strangely, among the marchers was Mary Bell, 
carrying one of the banners at the front of the protest. Despite all the evidence, including the notes, news reports, and past violent incidents, a killer was still on the loose. What really happened to Martin? Was his murder connected to Mary in any way? Sadly, while the mystery surrounding Martin's death remained unsolved, everything began to go back to normal. But then, tragedy struck again during the summer holidays when three-year-old Brian Howe went missing. On July 31, 1968, Brian was last seen playing with his dog on White House Road. As dinner time approached, Brian's parents called for him, but they didn't receive any response from him. After checking the whole house, they realized that Brian hadn't returned home yet. By this time, his parents were filled with intense worry and began searching the neighborhood for any signs of their missing son. Despite their efforts, they couldn't find any trace of Brian. Soon, a group of neighbors joined in the search and offered their assistance in the hope of finding the young boy. Shockingly, among those offering help were Mary and Norma. However, their demeanor came across as cold. Instead of showing concern, they appeared strangely happy and cheerful for a situation as serious as a missing child. This unexpected action raised suspicions among those who were involved in the search. It wasn't long until Mary and Norma's behavior took a bizarre turn after the search party failed to find any trace of Brian. Instead of showing concern or sadness, they began singing, dancing, and skipping, which was highly unusual given the circumstances. So sensing something amiss, the Howe family decided to involve the police. The authorities conducted a thorough search and interviewed nearly every member of the community. However, the outcome was devastating as they uncovered shocking news that nobody was prepared for. At 11.10 p.m., Brian's body was discovered in a wasteland near his home, where it was hidden among green and purple weeds. The police quickly realized that Brian had been murdered because they noticed a lot of bruises and scratches around his neck, indicating that he had been strangled. This evidence strongly suggested foul play and led the authorities to conclude that Brian was actually a victim of homicide. In addition to the bruises, Brian also had scratches all over his face, and blood was dripping from his mouth. Leading the investigation into Brian's murder was Detective Chief Constable James Dobson, who had also been present at the scene when Martin Brown's body was discovered just weeks earlier. Like a ray of hope in the dark upon examining Brian's body, he noticed some similarities to the previous case involving Martin, which made him believe that Martin's death may not have been an accident, but a murder. He observed that the cuts on Brian's body didn't seem to be motivated by anger, but rather appeared to be made with a curious playfulness. After the post-mortem, it was revealed that Brian had cuts on his genitals and six puncture wounds on his thighs and legs. Additionally, his hair had been cut and someone had carved the letter M into his stomach. It was concluded that only minimal force would have been needed to kill a three-year-old in the manner Brian was murdered. Since adults typically use more force than necessary, it suggested the perpetrator was likely a child. This crucial insight not only raised questions about the motive behind the attacks, but also provided direction to the investigators for next steps in the case. Now what was about to unfold in the story would make you wonder how someone could be so cruel and cold, adding to the most disturbing reason behind the murders. Police were quick to take action and visited over 1,000 homes and interviewed more than 1,200 children within the first 24 hours. They also distributed mimeograph questionnaires for parents to fill out about their children. Mary and Norma were also interviewed, but every time their answers were unclear and evasive. Because of this, police had to visit them multiple times to get clearer information. Officer Dobson found their behavior suspicious, as he noted that their answers and stories kept changing, and they appeared to be smiling throughout the interviews, as if the situation was a joke. It was common for children to feel scared or be uncooperative during investigations, but their cold reactions were quite strange. During one of her interviews, Mary suddenly recalled new information about Brian's murder. She claimed she had seen an unidentified eight-year-old boy on Delavale Road with Brian on the day of the murder. According to her, they had been playing together when the boy inexplicably started hitting Brian around the face and neck. She also mentioned that the boy was playing with a damaged silver-colored pair of scissors, which suggested that one of its legs may have been broken or snapped. 
Now, the really suspicious part here was that the scissors Mary described were found right by Brian's body, and the police hadn't told anyone about them. What was even stranger was that no pictures of the scissors had been taken, so the only ones who knew about the scissors were the police and the killer. As the investigation progressed, they also discovered that the boy Mary mentioned was actually at the airport with his family when Brian was killed. This raised serious suspicions about Mary, because how did Mary know all these details? At this point, the police had nearly ruled out everyone as suspects, except Mary and Norma. It was becoming clearer that they were deeply involved in the case, but the motive remained a mystery. After a conference and discussion, we decided it was time to have a word with Mary Bell, and Mr. Dobson and I went to the house. And so far as I recall it, on the first occasion, Mr. Bell, the father, uh, he refused to let us see the uh, young girl, and he had a big Alsatian dog which he threatened to uh, set upon us. So they shifted their focus to their next suspect, Norma. On August 4, 1968, Detective Dobson visited her for the third or fourth time to interview her. This time, Norma changed her story and said that she was with Mary, accompanying her to see Brian. This admission was a pivotal moment in the interview, which prompted Dobson to take Norma to the police station immediately to obtain an official statement. It was during this process at the station that Norma finally revealed the chilling truth that the police had been anxiously awaiting. Norma revealed that Mary brought her to witness Brian's lifeless body and admitted that she had killed Brian. Mary explained to her how she strangled him and manipulated his lungs, claiming that was how one ended a life. She described how Mary ran her fingers over Brian's lips and expressed her enjoyment in the act, but Mary didn't stop there. She even revealed the razor to Norma and lifted Brian's shirt to show her the marks she had made on him. This terrible confession portrayed Mary's disturbing mindset and her lack of remorse for her heinous actions. At 8.30 p.m., they headed to the spot where Brian's body was discovered, and Norma directed him to a concrete block. When Dobson checked underneath, he actually found a razor with blood on it. Finally, the police had physical evidence which could link Mary to the crime scene. It was truly shocking that a young girl could have such a criminal mindset. The fact that Mary planned and carried out the murder with such precision was incredibly disturbing. On August 5, 1968, at 12.15 a.m., Dobson and two police constables visited Mary's house to take her in for questioning. However, Mary surprised them by becoming defensive and agitated. This sudden change in her behavior disrupted their plans as it became clear that Mary was not going to cooperate easily with the investigation. At one point, things got even more intense. When the police informed her about Norma's confession, suddenly Mary's unusually smiling face turned into a mask of anger, and she began to threaten Norma as well, showing signs of anxiety and tension. It was clear that she was desperate to hide her crimes, to the extent she was willing to harm her own accomplice. But despite the intense confrontation, Dobson couldn't detain Mary for long because there wasn't enough solid evidence against her. There was still a lingering doubt about whether Norma's confession was genuine or she was fabricating her confession to shift blame onto Mary. So without any concrete proof, they had no choice but to release both Mary and Norma. However, they continued to closely monitor their actions, being aware that the truth might still be hidden beneath the surface. On August 7, 1968, Detective Dobson made it a point to attend Brian Howe's funeral which took place on that day. His keen eye scanned the crowd, scouting for suspicious behavior from anyone. It was during this solemn occasion that Dobson noticed something unsettling about Mary's behavior. At that moment, he felt a strong conviction that Mary was indeed responsible for Brian's murder. He said, Mary Bell was standing in front of the house house when the coffin was brought out. I was watching her, and it was when I saw her there that I knew I did not dare risk another day. She stood there laughing, laughing and rubbing her hands. I thought, my God, I gotta bring her in. She'll do another one. So, he promptly decided to arrest Mary and took her in for questioning at Westgate Road Station. There, Mary shocked the police with her clever and sophisticated way of avoiding their questions. Her ability to deflect their inquiries left them both impressed and unnerved. I used to think she had like a computer brain. 
When you one put a question to Mary, she would start answering almost before you'd finished the question. And then she'd continue and answer the next four or five questions still unasked. This was a strange thing. It's rather like someone going into a maze and the first question put her into the maze and her mind told her she could get through that maze and come out the other side unscathed. Mary attempted to shift the blame onto Norma, claiming that Norma was responsible for Brian's death by squeezing his throat tightly. According to Mary, she tried to intervene to stop Norma, but she became enraged and started shouting at her. Mary said that Norma then threw Brian, upon which he hit the ground, ultimately leading to his death. Here, Dobson quickly realized that Mary's attempt to blame Norma was a ploy to complicate the case. However, Mary made a critical mistake by providing detailed explanations of the events, including details that even Norma wasn't aware of. That was when finally Dobson's suspicions were confirmed that Mary was the true culprit behind Brian's murder. At this point, Dobson also wanted Mary to confess her involvement in Martin's case. However, with lack of sufficient evidence to directly link the two cases, he focused on Brian's murder. By 8 p.m. that evening, Dobson arrested Mary for Brian's murder, and shortly after 8.30 p.m., he arrested Norma as well for withholding information. Both were taken to the Newcastle West Police Station for further questioning and to face the consequences for their actions. One must have felt sorry for her at the time. There's no question about that because uh, she was a young girl. She was only 11 years of age. She didn't realise the enormity of her predicament. She didn't realise what she was facing in future life. And during the course of the investigation, I frequently took in bags of apples for both her and Norma Joyce. They were only kids and they really didn't know what was happening, I don't suppose, at that age. The key factor in Martin's death were those notes that were left by the killer, and the investigation became more intense when detectives revisited those notes. They decided to compare the handwriting on the notes with samples from Mary and Norma's school books. After reaching out to the girls' school, they finally obtained the evidence they needed. The handwriting from the notes bore a striking resemblance to Mary and Norma's, and it seemed like they took turns writing them. First, Mary wrote a few words, then Norma wrote a few words, and so on. The discovery left no doubt in their minds that Mary and Norma were responsible for Martin's murder, and had been orchestrating various unusual acts to throw off the investigation. Surprisingly, police also found a story penned by Mary in one of her school books just a day after Martin's death. In the story, she described crowds gathering outside an old house and how she was curious about a boy who had mysteriously died. What shocked investigators even more was the detailed drawing accompanying the story, which depicted Martin's lifeless body, a workman stumbling upon it, and a small pill bottle labeled tablet near the scene. This airy narrative mirrored the real-life events surrounding Martin's death, but the most gruesome thing about this was the pill bottle that was found near Martin's body had never been mentioned publicly. Only a handful of people knew about it, the police, the three boys who found the body, the workmen, and the killer. But the shock didn't end there. Police also discovered gray fibers from one of Mary's dresses, which were also found on the bodies of both the victims. With undeniable evidence tying them to Martin's murder, both Mary and Norma faced charges. The news rippled through the community like wildfire, leaving everyone with a burning question, why? At this point of the video, you're probably wondering the same thing. What could drive an 11-year-old girl to commit such a heinous act? Mary's violent tendencies didn't just emerge suddenly. They were present from a young age, and her disturbing behavior was widely recognized among her peers at school and on the playground. From the beginning, there were signs that something wasn't quite right about her. Mary's aggressive behavior raised concerns among psychologists who explored various potential underlying issues. While aggression could be linked to bipolar disorder, where manic episodes trigger impulsivity and a loss of control, Mary's case appeared more complex. However, given Mary's unusual reactions, trauma emerged as a more fitting explanation. Trauma could trigger unexpected responses and behaviors, which could shape a person's actions and perceptions in profound ways. As a child, Mary found it hard to connect with others and remain distant. At the age of four, she finally formed a bond with a five-year-old neighbor who lived on the same street. Tragically, that girl was fatally struck by a bus right in front of Mary, 
which left her deeply traumatized. This loss was especially profound as the girl had been Mary's only source of comfort after enduring hours of abuse at home. Mary's mother also played a detrimental role in shaping her upbringing and emotional state. It's important to note that the case of Mary Bell sparked a debate about how society dealt with children who committed crimes. Some people believed that kids might not have fully grasped the seriousness of their actions and hence shouldn't face the same consequences as adults. They thought children needed special care and guidance instead of harsh punishment. On the other hand, some argued that if a child committed a violent crime, they should face the same consequences as an adult because the harm caused was just as severe. Mary Bell's troubled upbringing, marked by neglect, abuse, and exposure to violence, most likely had a big impact on her actions. This showed how important it was to look at the psychological and social factors behind someone's behavior. By addressing these issues early on, we could help prevent similar crimes in the future. It was also a reminder that providing support and intervention to those in difficult situations could make a big difference in preventing harm. On December 5, 1968, Mary Bell and Norma Bell faced charges of manslaughter for their actions. During the trial, both girls pointed fingers at each other, suggesting their involvement in the crimes. The two girls were very different in personality. Mary, very bright and sharp, and could answer back to the council when they questioned her. She could make quite witty little remarks. The other girl was not as bright, and I think was completely overawed by the setting. And in a sense, the court almost separated the two and said, therefore, the bright one must have done it, and the duller one probably didn't. In order to make it clear, court-appointed psychologist testified that Mary exhibited typical signs of psychopathy. This suggested that she might not have been fully aware or accountable for her behavior. In simpler terms, they argued that Mary's mental state influenced her actions, possibly affecting her ability to understand the consequences of her actions. After all these debates, on December 17, 1968, the girls finally received their verdicts. Norma was cleared from all accusations and allowed to return home. However, Mary was found guilty of manslaughter, but with diminished responsibility, meaning her actions were influenced by her mental state. As a result, she was given an indefinite prison sentence, known as detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. This meant she would be detained for as long as necessary, without a fixed term. Nearly nine years later, in 1977, Mary managed to escape from the adult prison where she had been transferred, but her freedom didn't last long, as authorities quickly recaptured her. However, after serving just 12 years, she was released from prison in 1980, at the age of 23. To protect her identity and give her a chance at a fresh start, she was granted anonymity and allowed to begin a new life under a new name. In 1984, Mary welcomed a daughter into the world, sparking significant debate about whether she would be permitted to raise a child given her past. Despite objections due to her history of murdering two children, Mary was ultimately allowed to keep and care for her daughter. When local authorities disclosed Mary's location and identity, it caused a stir among the community, sparking outrage. Mary's daughter, unaware of her mother's dark past, found herself caught up in the commotion. In response, Mary took her case to the high court and sought lifelong anonymity, not only for herself, but also for her daughter. This legal battle added another chapter to Mary Bell's ongoing saga which raised questions about the rights and privacy of individuals with troubled past. Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss, president of the family division, issued a ruling to protect the identities and locations of the Bells. This ruling prohibited the media from disclosing any information regarding their current identities and whereabouts. It remains a mystery what identity Mary and her daughter adopted or where they now reside. The complex interplay of nature and nurture in shaping Mary's behavior continues to puzzle and intrigue those who seek to understand the depths of human psychology. Two people shot outside of a Vancouver elementary school are fighting for their lives tonight at Peace Health Hospital. Outside Sarah J. Anderson Elementary School in Vancouver, Washington, the evening of November 26, 2019, 
bore witness to an unthinkable tragedy. We confirmed that this was a domestic violence situation. In fact, one of the people inside of the car, according to the Clark County Sheriff's Office, says that that person had a restraining order out against the suspect. A mother shot in front of her children by the very person who should have been their protector. 35-year-old Tiffany Hill, a symbol of strength and love, fell victim to an act of cruelty at the hands of her estranged husband, 38-year-old Keelan Hill. Why would a father turn violence upon his own family, subjecting his children to the horror of witnessing their mother's life being extinguished before their innocent eyes? What drove a man to such extremes? Northwest Vancouver, Washington stands as a charming city just to skip away from Portland, Oregon. With its mix of urban allure and natural beauty, Vancouver has carved its own identity as a beloved sister city, known for its small-town charm. As you stroll through the streets, vibrant murals add a splash of color to the city's character. Vancouver even claims a quirky connection to pop culture, with whispers that it might be the inspiration behind the iconic American town featured in The Simpsons. Despite this lively backdrop, events in recent years have cast a shadow over the community. On a Tuesday evening in November 2019, the parking lot of Sarah J. Anderson Elementary School in Hazeldell became the backdrop for a moment that defied the unusual harmony of this neighborhood. Tiffany Hill was born as Tiffany Ojeda on April 16, 1984, to Aria Conde and Jesus Ojeda Jr., who was raised in a close-knit family in New York. One of seven children, she grew up with four sisters and two brothers. Tiffany's early life was filled with love and support, and her mother, Aria, played a crucial role in her upbringing. As a child, Tiffany attended PS 131 Elementary School before moving to McKinley Junior High. She later spent her high school years at John Dewey High School. In 2005, Tiffany decided to join the U.S. Marine Corps. In 2007, she was deployed to Iraq, where she served for two years. During her service time, she received service awards, which included the Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, the National Defensive Service Medal, the Iraq Campaign Medal, the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and the Navy Sea Service Deployment. In 2008, she was honorably discharged for injuries she suffered while serving. Tiffany's life took another turn when she entered into a marriage with Keelan Hill. The relationship brought forth three children. Kayla, Cameron, and Jasmine. However, while things may have seemed rosy from the outside, the dynamics of Tiffany's marriage were far from idyllic. On the seemingly ordinary Tuesday afternoon of November 26, 2019, the air around Sarah J. Anderson Elementary School in Hazeldale, Washington, carried an unsettling tension. As the clock struck 3.15 p.m., gunshots were fired spreading fear amongst the few around the school who had not already left for their homes. Authorities received a distress call ushering them to the school's parking lot. What awaited them was a scene of horror. Tiffany Hill, who was 35, and her mother, Aria Conde, lay wounded inside a Toyota Sienna van. The echo of shots lingered, a stark contrast to the typical sounds of children's laughter that usually filled the air. Sergeant Brent Waddell of the Clark County Sheriff's Office, upon arrival, revealed the gravity of the situation. When the deputies got here, uh, there was two victims. Both of them were transported to the hospital. They also received information about suspect information, suspect's vehicle. The atmosphere wasn't one without witnesses, as one of them happened to be a 16-year-old boy who had been around the school when the incident happened. So I was going to play basketball, and I was on the side over by the fence and I saw the shooter he was in the parking lot and he was aiming straight at the van and all I was just saying is like I was so scared I didn't know what to do so I didn't want to say anything because like I felt like he was gonna aim at me and um, like they sh he shot the wife and then the ambulance came and then he drove off and he looked at me and I looked at him and I was just trying to like get, stay away because I didn't want anything to happen to me and I'm happy that he didn't shoot me or anything because I'm very lucky. His name was Jonas Abbott and he was there to practice basketball. Besides Jonas, there was a teacher who was inside the school at the time of the incident. 
Um, I was in the middle of a parent-teacher conference um, when we just heard some bangs outside and I didn't really think anything of it. I thought kids were dropping something outside, but then a woman came and ran up to the door screaming, holding her arm and telling us that she was shot and that um, she, we need to call an ambulance and call 911. This school, having just concluded its daily activities, found itself thrust into an unexpected lockdown. An unsettling feeling enveloped the entire school after the tragedy, leaving teachers, students, and parents in an intense surge of fear. Among the chaos, Tiffany's kids Kayla, Cameron, and Jasmine were now having to process what happened. Two of them had been in the same unlucky car with their mom and grandma, while one had been inside the school. They were headed out to celebrate their youngest sister's birthday. Sergeant Waddell confirmed that all three children were unharmed physically, a glimmer of relief in an otherwise tragic scene. The children and their mother, Aria, who had run to school to call for help, were witnesses to the violent act. Aria had even sustained injuries in the shooting as she tried to shield her daughter. She would later recount the incident. Tragically, the day's horrors didn't end with the shooting. Keelan Hill, the alleged perpetrator, had fled the scene, with law enforcement in pursuit. The chase reached a grim conclusion at the intersection of Anderson Road and Padden Parkway in Vancouver. Keelan Hill, convicted felon and the alleged assailant, exited his vehicle and inflicted a fatal gunshot wound to himself after a short confrontation with the police. As Keelan Hill took his own life, Tiffany Hill's fate was also sealed. Transported to the hospital, she was also pronounced dead, leaving behind grieving family members and a community grappling with the profound impact of this unfortunate event. The aftermath of the incident revealed a community shattered by the ripples of domestic violence. Investigators in the relentless pursuit of answers sought to piece together a timeline, grappling with the critical questions of how Keelan Hill, a convicted felon, had managed to acquire a firearm. The haunting revelation that he had attempted to purchase a gun outside Portland, despite being denied due to his criminal history, raised pressing concerns about the illegal means by which he obtained the weapon used in the tragic incident. Almost immediately, the investigation led to Keelan and Tiffany's relationship. The story of Tiffany and Keelan Hill's tumultuous relationship, marred by violence, unfolded in a series of documented incidents. To understand that, Let's go back to September 11, 2019. Back then, Tiffany had reported a disturbing episode where her husband screamed at her in front of their children, throwing her belongings out the bedroom. Attempting to call 911 for help, Tiffany found herself subjected to further violence. Keelan threw her against a wall, chased her down the stairs, and pushed her into the garage. The physical altercation left Tiffany with a concussion and whiplash, further exasperating the trauma. Following this traumatic incident, Keelan Hill was arrested in September 2019 for domestic violence, assault, and interfering with a report of domestic violence. However, his release from Clark County Jail the next day marked the beginning of a legal struggle. A judge issued a domestic violence restraining order, reflecting the severity of the situation. The restraining order, a legal barrier meant to protect Tiffany, prohibited Keelan from owning or purchasing firearms. It mandated the surrender of any firearms in his possession, emphasizing the potential danger he posed. Tiffany, in her September 19th affidavit, expressed her fear, stating that if he had a gun and got angry and drunk enough, he would definitely use it against her without any doubt. Despite these legal safeguards, Keelan Hill attempted to purchase a rifle at Walmart in Monmouth County on October 6, 2019. His background check failed due to the existing restraining order, highlighting a critical point of intervention in preventing further violence. According to Oregon state law, failed background checks must be reported to relevant local law enforcement agencies. The Monmouth County Sheriff was notified, and in turn they passed on information to the Clark County Sheriff's Office, initiating a chain of events that underscored the systematic gaps in preventing firearm access for individuals with a history of domestic violence. In Tiffany's desperate attempts to shield herself and her children from harm, she reported multiple violations of the restraining order to the Vancouver Police Department and Clark County Sheriff's Office. 
Tiffany's statement painted a harrowing picture of the relentless pursuit and intimidation she was facing. She wrote in a protection order petition that Keelan was getting angrier and kept violating the no-contact order, and that he knew the only way to get her was through the children. She said that she feared for the children's safety. On October 10, 2019, Tiffany Hill reported another violation of the restraining order. After her husband showed up at a restaurant where she was eating, Hill was finally arrested about a month later on November 7th after his wife reported seeing him at several locations that day. Deputies from the Clark County Sheriff's Office found a GPS tracker inside a black box attached with magnets to the gas tank of Tiffany Hill's vehicle. As the legal battles intensified, additional charges were filed against Keelan Hill for attempting to possess a firearm and violating the domestic violence no-contact order. Tiffany's ongoing ordeal, compounded by the perceived threat level, prompted domestic violence prosecutors to seek a significant increase in Keelan Hill's bail on November 13th. I stopped reporting because he's made aware of it if I report and I'm scared of his anger and retaliation. Despite my non-report, he continued to escalate because he feels he's smarter than everybody else and he's untouchable. Uh, he is here now because he placed a tracking device on my vehicle um, and tried to possess a weapon. Um, those two things are major indicators of what I've known all along, deep down, that he's going to kill me if he's given the opportunity. I beg you to not allow him to get to me and my children. Um, I have no family here, nowhere to go. We have no money and nowhere to hide from him. He's made sure of that. Thank you. The extreme risk he posed led prosecutors to request raising the bail from $75,000 to $2 million. However, the court set his bail at $250,000 a decision that drew attention to the challenges in the legal system's response to potential threats. Despite the legal proceedings and interventions, Keelan Hill posted bail on November 21, 2019, raising concerns about the bail system's approach to individuals charged with domestic violence offenses. The relatively high bail amount reflected the perceived danger, yet it fell short of the prosecution's request. Five days later, on November 26, the tragic culmination of this tumultuous history unfolded outside Sarah J. Anderson Elementary School. The incident not only exposed the inadequacies in addressing domestic violence within the legal framework, but also highlighted the intricate intersections of law enforcement, judicial decisions, and the inherent challenges in assessing the potential for extreme violence. Tiffany Hill, a victim in the relentless cycle of abuse, faced a system that struggled to provide an effective shield against an imminent threat. Tiffany's Hill tragic demise resonated through the anguished voices of her grieving family, offering a poignant glimpse into the aftermath of a life cut short by senseless cruelty. Aria Kandi, Tiffany's mother, stood as a pillar of strength even in the face of unimaginable pain. Recalling Tiffany's essence, Kandi painted a vivid picture of a compassionate soul she said that she was so sweet, so good, and cared for everyone. She would put everything to the side if someone needed something. Condi's words carried the weight of a mother's love and an inconsolable loss. Amidst the outpouring of grief, Kanji found herself thrust into an unexpected role, becoming the guardian of Tiffany's three children. The abrupt transition from celebration to tragedy occurred in the parking lot of Sarah J. Anderson Elementary, where Kanji, along with her daughter and children, had intended to rejoice in the fifth birthday of the youngest child. The incident unfolded with shocking swiftness. Kanji, being caught in the crossfire, spoke of the shattered windshield and instinctual urge to shield her daughter. As Kanji underwent surgery, the cruel reality of Tiffany's fate unfolded. She says that was the hardest part, that she didn't believe that her child was gone forever. In a heart-wrenching revelation, Connie disclosed the purpose of her presence in Vancouver, which was intended to take her daughter back home to New York. Tiffany's untimely death became a poignant plea for change, a call to strengthen laws and ensure the safety of those who find themselves ensnared in the perilous web of domestic violence. Connie's hope, expressed through tears and sorrow, was that Tiffany's story would spark change, that the pain endured by her family would not be in vain. She asserted, it should be strong. It should. It should. And, and, and people need to know, you know, maybe out of this, something good comes out and other women are safe. 
You know, I mean, we want our babies to be safe. Meanwhile, the exclusive interview with Judge John Fairgrave, the presiding judge in Keelan's case, offered insight into the complexities of dealing with domestic violence cases within the legal framework. Tiffany Hill's relentless efforts to secure a protection order showcased the lengths victims go to shield themselves and their families from harm. Judge Fairgrave, candid in his reflections, acknowledged the inherent difficulty in predicting the trajectory of domestic violence cases. Each case, he noted, presents unique challenges, making it challenging to ascertain the level of threat a perpetrator may pose. The decision-making process, bound by legal constraints and considerations, reflects the delicate balance judges must navigate in setting bail amounts. In the case of Keeland Hill, Judge Fairgrieve raised the bail from $75,000 to $250,000, a decision influenced by the specifics of the case and financial considerations. The judge acknowledged the weight of every decision and said that such judgments would always weigh on those who make them. As Tiffany Hill's story reverberates through the collective consciousness, her family's grief becomes a rallying point for advocacy and change. Tabitha Ojeda, one of Tiffany Hill's sisters, stepped into a role defined by profound loss and unforeseen responsibility after Tiffany's murder. Tiffany's life, cut short by domestic violence, left behind three young children, for whom Tabitha became an immediate guardian. As the news of Tiffany's murder reverberated across the country, Tabitha's journey took an abrupt turn. The GoFundMe campaign, initiated by Tabitha in collaboration with other family members, sought financial support and shared the heartbreaking story of a life extinguished too soon. In her plea for support, Tabitha vividly portrayed Tiffany as a multifaceted individual, a warrior, a mother, a sister, and a veteran. The decision to relocate Tiffany's children to New York State underscored Tabitha's commitment to providing a stable environment for them. Not just Tabitha, but Janice, another one of her sisters, pledged to protect, support, and nurture these children for the rest of their lives. Um, they're doing really well. I mean, they're resilient, so they do as well as they can be. Um, you know, they take it day by day. They made friends. They have their space, you know. At first, it was a little rough, but um, they're making it through. They definitely miss their mom a lot. Um, but overall, they're super resilient and strong really strong kids. How old are they now? Wow. Uh, <laughs> seven, nine, and 12. She's going to be 13 soon, Kayla. Tabitha's decision to relocate Tiffany's children despite challenges reflected determination to shield them from the trauma of their mother's violent end. It symbolized a united family's attempt to provide normalcy and security after an unfathomable tragedy. Tabitha's perspective woven into the GoFundMe post, hinted at the broader implications of domestic violence and the need for societal change. In the face of judicial decisions navigating domestic violence cases, Tabitha's role became crucial. An interview with Judge Fairgrieve provided insights into the legal system's challenges in addressing such cases. The judge's acknowledgement that every decision had potential consequences coupled with his admission that more needed to be done resonated with the family's plea for change. After Tiffany's case, the discussion surrounding domestic violence and the protection of victims from their abusers became louder. In April 2020, Washington Governor Jay Inslee signed the Tiffany Hill Act into law. The law allows courts to order people excused of domestic violence to wear GPS ankle devices, which can be monitored by officials and linked to an app on the victim's phone to alert them when the offender is nearby. Tiffany's loved ones said technology allowing her to track her abuser's location could have saved her life, and now they hope that it will help others like her in the future. While Tiffany was taken from them too soon, and nothing could ever fill the void she left in their hearts, this means that her death was not completely in vain. As we go through the intricate layers of this heart-wrenching case, the echoes of this tragic day linger in our minds. Does the narrative surrounding this case resonate with your understanding of domestic violence and its far-reaching consequences? Share your thoughts, because your perspective matters. Also, 
If you have recommendations for other cases you'd like us to explore, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Yeah, I'm sorry that I said to you that, Matt. Yes, yes, get out, around. get yes, out. Take I was Uber on my own. Moments after this video was shot, Madison Brooks, a 19-year-old Louisiana State University student, was savagely assaulted and violated. CCTV footage showed Madison walking towards a car as she followed a group of four teenagers. Could they have been involved in the assault? If so, why would a group of young kids commit such a heinous crime? Madison Kennedy Brooks was born on May 7, 2004 to her parents, John Brooks and Ashley Bastard. She was a sophomore who worked hard to finish her studies. Madison was a top student, managing to complete an impressive 34 credits as a junior, while also working and being active in her sorority, Alpha. During the summer, instead of taking a break, Madison stayed in Baton Rouge to earn extra credits to get ahead in her studies. She was even accepted into the Manship School of Mass Communication, which was regarded among students as a notable achievement. Madison loved adventure and spending time with her loved ones. She enjoyed activities like skydiving and skiing. Even though she seemed focused on her studies and activities, she kept her personal life guarded. She didn't share much about her relationships on social media. It was possible that she had a boyfriend, but she kept it hidden. She seemed to be single, but her private nature meant that some questions about her personal life were left unanswered. Madison had a bright future ahead of her full of endless possibilities. On the night of January 14, 2023, everything changed for Madison in an instant. At around 10 p.m. that night, she went to a local bar called Reggie's in Tigerland. At 10.18 p.m., four other men also arrived at Reggie's. Now, this bar was popular among young adults for their 50-cent liquor shots, serving of alcohol to those without proper identification and free entry for underage women. The four men and Madison didn't know each other before that night, but after some drinks and conversations, they started to get close. In the late hours of the night, Madison and the teenagers left the bar and headed down towards their parked vehicle. They all got into the vehicle together. Later on, they dropped her off near the Pelican Lake subdivision off the Burbank Drive at around 3 a.m. Tragically, the evening took a devastating turn, when the EBRSO Traffic Division received a distressing call about a fatal crash on the Burbank Drive. Madison Brooks was struck by a car, and despite being rushed to a nearby hospital, she could not be saved. On January 16, 2023, the police began investigating what happened to Madison on that night. On January 18, 2023, the East Baton Rouge Parish Coroner's Office conducted a post-mortem examination of Madison's body. The pathologist who performed the autopsy observed injuries consistent with sexual assault in her back cavity. The coroner determined that Madison's cause of death was multiple traumatic injuries, resulting from second-degree vehicle collision. The vehicle collision was clear, but the presence of a violation left the detectives perplexed. When examining the events at the bar, it was found out that Madison arrived at Reggie's at 10.06 p.m. Shortly after that, at 10.18 p.m., four men, Cason Carver and Kavion Washington, both 18 years old, Everett Lee and Desmond Carter, 17 years old, also entered the bar. Witnesses observed Madison and the group drinking and socializing together. Inside the bar, Madison and Desmond were seen hugging and dancing, indicating they were enjoying themselves. However, it became evident that Madison had consumed too much alcohol as Desmond helped her when she stumbled, even assisted her when she stumbled and even after she fell onto the floor. At one point while seated on a stool, Madison stood up to adjust her pants, but lost her balance and stumbled backwards. Later, she fell while attempting to stand from a bench near the bar's entrance. As closing time approached, Madison approached the group of men and requested a ride home. Kaysen recalled agreeing to give her a ride out of concern for her well-being as she appeared highly intoxicated. CCTV footage outside the bar showed her trying to catch up with the men walking ahead, indicating she had consumed too much alcohol and might have been overserved. After catching up with the men, Madison reached Kaysen's parked vehicle at 1.51 a.m. 
Kaysen got in the driver's seat. Everett sat in the passenger seat. Desmond and Madison, along with Kavion, all occupied the back seats. On January 21st and 22nd, 2023, investigators visited the homes of the four male suspects to question them about Madison's case. They found out that Kaysen, one of the suspects, had asked Madison for her address so as to drop her at home. However, Madison was too drunk to answer him properly, so Kaysen decided to drive around until he stopped the car near Jennifer Jean Drive. Kaysen claimed he overheard Desmond asking Madison if she wanted to have intercourse, to which she allegedly agreed. Subsequently, Desmond and Kavion took turns having intercourse with Madison in the back seat of the car, while Kaysen and Ever occupied the front seats. Kaysen admitted that Madison may have been too intoxicated to consent to the activities in the back seat. Afterwards, Kaysen attempted to find Madison's home, but ultimately dropped her off at a random subdivision. It's uncertain why they stopped, or if Madison wanted to leave the car to call an Uber. Conflicting accounts surrounded the events, but the result was that Madison was left alone on the streets, heavily intoxicated and struggling to walk. On Monday, January 23, 2023, the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office arrested the suspects. Kavion and Desmond were charged with third-degree rape under Louisiana law. This charge applied when the victim was unable to resist or understand the nature of the act due to intoxication, and the offender knew or should have known of the victim's condition. Everett Lee and Cason Carver were charged with being accomplices to the crime, meaning they were present during the crime but did not participate directly. Now, the confusing part was that, initially, they claimed they were concerned about leaving her at the bar because she wasn't in a safe state of mind. Then the two of them allegedly took advantage of her in the back seat and had their way with her. But suddenly after that, they were okay leaving the same cloudy-headed person in the streets. How did that make sense? Where was the concern really shown? Now, regardless of why they left Madison, it led to a terrible outcome. Around 3 a.m., Madison was standing on a dark stretch of the Burbank Drive near Pelican Lakes Parkway when a rideshare vehicle hit her. Despite the pouring rain, two kind people stopped to help and perform CPR on Madison, with guidance from emergency services over the phone. Sadly, Madison succumbed to her injuries at the hospital. Medical records from when she was admitted that early morning showed that her blood alcohol level was around 0.319%. These levels indicate that she had consumed a lot of alcohol. BAC between 0.25 and 0.39 is considered to fall under poisoning and loss of consciousness. The driver of the rideshare vehicle, however, faced no charges as he was sober at the time of the accident and promptly contacted emergency services. Kaysen's bond was set at $50,000, Everett's at $75,000, and Kavion's at $150,000. Desmond was sent to a juvenile detention center and awaited his bond hearing, which was postponed to February 22, 2023. Before their court appearance, the defendant's attorney claimed that a video showed Madison was intoxicated, but still capable of giving consent. Sorry that I said to you that, Dad. Dad. Dad get out, out, get Dad, out. out. I was Uber on my own. Here are the facts of the case with the latest developments. Ms. Brooks was confirmed on video dancing and talking with the juvenile defendant inside of the bar. Ms. Brooks exited the bar, approached the defendants, and asked them for a ride, which was confirmed on video, which was released last night. The two defendants who engaged in a consensual sexual act with Ms. Brooks did so after obtaining verbal consent. The way this is being reported and taken out of context from the police report is factually inaccurate. However, the judge disagreed after reviewing the footage and statements from the suspects stating that the video only highlighted the defendant's disregard for Madison's well-being. Prosecutors pledged to pursue upgraded charges of first-degree rape and planned to convene a grand jury. The suspects were released on bond, but were subject to strict conditions, including no social media posts about the case, random drug testing, house arrest, and wearing ankle monitors. On February 22nd, a grand jury upgraded Desmond's charges to first-degree rape 
meaning he would be tried as an adult. Later on, few developments brought to light the troubling incidents from Kavion Washington's past. On February 3rd, he faced arrest and charges of first-degree rape, stemming from an alleged assault on a 12-year-old girl when Kavion was 15. The victim recounted meeting Kavion at a pool party, where he forcefully entered her apartment, despite her repeated refusals. He allegedly assaulted her for nearly an hour before leaving, prompting her to report the incident to her mother and the authorities. Although the investigation initially stalled, news of Kavion's arrest in connection with Madison's case led to the victim to share her story on social media, prompting investigators to reopen her case. Now apart from the two cases, Kavion faced another arrest and charge related to a third assault that occurred in the same Baton Rouge area in October 2022. The victim reported the alleged violation to the police on January 25th, the day after Kavion and the other three men were arrested in connection with Madison's case. Currently, Kavion is indicted in Madison's case at Livingston Parish. And meanwhile, a grand jury upgraded charges against Carter to a charge of first-degree rape, which carried a sentence of life in prison without parole. In response to the charges against the suspects, LSU President William F. Tate vowed to investigate Reggie's bar for serving alcohol to minors. The Louisiana Office of Alcohol and Tobacco Control issued an emergency suspension for Reggie's bar, citing the seriousness of the allegations and the potential threat to public safety. Some patrons consuming so much booze they can barely keep their balance. This girl falls off the bar. It's happening at one of the most popular college bars in America, Reggie's Bar. You cannot say, oh, we're following the law and we care about young people who come into our bar and, and be totally irresponsible with the way that you serve. This wasn't the first time Reggie's Bar faced scrutiny, with previous incidents including a stabbing, alleged assault, and an armed altercation. Students were often seen falling over, drinking excessively, and engaging in unruly behavior. It was known as one of the most popular college bars in America. The bar's owner, Darren Adams, had faced legal trouble in the past, including a raid by Baton Rouge police in 2017, resulting in the suspension of its license due to numerous arrests for underage drinking. Despite Reggie's statement claiming that Madison entered the bar with false identification and did not consume any drinks in her last hour there, the bar's history suggested a lax approach in enforcing alcohol laws and ensuring patron safety. This statement appeared more like an attempt to shift blame and liability away from the bar, rather than taking responsibility for its role in the tragic incident involving Madison. The tragic death of Madison deeply impacted her family and community, sparking conversations about accountability, safety, and justice. Here's what Ashley Odak, Madison's high school friend says about her. So in high school, I had the advantage of going with Maddie and um, she was amazing. She really left me in this world with one thing that kindness and love is always the answer no matter what. And I remember in high school, it was really hard. And I met her in the bathroom because she was just this gorgeous girl. She was so beautiful. And I remember walking up to her in the bathroom and I was like, you are so beautiful. And she was so nice to me, so welcoming. And she was a year older than me and nor normal people would be like, you know, like, thank you. Like, that's all. Maddie was so nice. She decided to, at football games, she would come get me from the student section and we'd go dance with each other at the uh, football games and everything. And then we, would, we went to, in the, those pictures you have, we went to Coretta's. And she was just all around a nice person. Like, I was going through the hardest times where I felt bullied and everything. And she showed me love in, like, a way nobody else could. Yeah. And that's how I want her to be remembered. I want her to be remembered for the girl that she was. She was yeah. the nicest soul still is. While Madison's loved ones mourned at her loss, they were also determined to ensure that her story lived on in meaningful ways. I see life now as two parts, the life I had before she died and the life that I'm living now. Um, we want to provide a scholarship for someone in need to advocate for the safety of young adults and to spread awareness for the gift of organ donation, which Maddie was able to donate her heart valves and her kidney.
Madison's family vowed to keep her memory alive through the Madison Brooks Foundation, established to provide financial assistance to those in need, advocate for safety of young girls, and promote awareness about organ donation. Madison's decision to donate her heart and kidneys inspired others, and a star in the Taurus constellation was named in her honor, symbolizing bravery and strength. In addition to the foundation, efforts were made to enhance safety for women, particularly in vulnerable situations. LSU's Girls' Ride, initiated by students, offered a platform for women to request safe transportation aided by female drivers, providing a crucial service for those in need of assistance after a night out. Well, I've also been personally abandoned and put in a vulnerable, scary situation, and I had to walk home. Hoping more girls will take advantage of this and be like, hey, I need a ride, instead of just walking home or getting a ride from a total stranger. The events leading up to Madison's death have been subjected to scrutiny and debate. Allegations of victim blaming and questions about consent complicated the narrative surrounding the case. While some argued that Madison's choices contributed to the outcome, Others emphasized the importance of holding individuals accountable for their actions. Defense attorneys raised concerns about the handling of evidence and portrayal of their clients in the media. Amidst the legal proceedings and public discourse, it would be essential to remember the human impact of Madison's passing. As the case further unfolds, there is hope for healing and closure for all those affected. As we say goodbye to Madison Brooks, were left with heavy hearts and a strong desire for change. Her family promised to keep her spirit alive through the Madison Brooks Foundation, helping others and spreading awareness about organ donation. A female model is suspected to have been murdered as police found a dismembered body of a recently missing woman in Taipo. It's a skull, actually. It's no skin or any uh, meat uh, on it. So basically the skull with hair. We will do a thorough search again to find the torso and other parts of the missing body. Sources say that the victim was model and media personality Abby Choi. February 21st, 2023, seemed like an ordinary day for the renowned 28-year-old model, Abby Choi Tin Fung, AKA Abby Choi. She headed to pick up her daughter with her ex-brother-in-law behind the wheel of the car. Little did anyone know it would be the last time Abby would be seen alive. After Abby went missing for a few hours, her worried husband decided to file a missing person report. Given their power and fame, the police swiftly hopped on the case and launched a thorough investigation. Just three days later, Abby was discovered in the most unimaginable way, in an apartment rented by her ex-in-laws. The house was turned into a gruesome slaughterhouse to carry out this heinous act. Inside the house, Abby met a gruesome fate. She was murdered, dismembered, and shockingly, parts of her body were even cooked. The discovery of her legs stored in a refrigerator painted a horrifying scene. The house revealed an unsettling collection of tools suspected to be used in the dismemberment. Cleavers, meat grinders, electric saws, hammers, raincoats, gloves, and masks. Creating an ominous atmosphere, all the evidence pointed towards Abby's ex-husband's family, raising disturbing questions about the motive behind the atrocious act. Why did the family choose such a horrendous way to end Abby's life? Dark secrets drove them to commit such a monstrous act, turning their home into a nightmarish crime scene. Born on July 11, 1994, Abby Choi Tin Fung, known by her English name Abby Choi, was born in a wealthy family with business ties in China. She was brought up by her mother, Sheng Ying Fa, and her stepfather, Soe Choi San. With a reported net worth of 100 million Hong Kong dollars, Abby became a well-known fashion icon and socialite, gracing the pages of esteemed magazines such as Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Elle. However, Abby was more than just a glamorous figure. She had a caring side, especially towards animals co-founding the Palms Charitable Organization, a Hong Kong-based initiative focused on rescuing animals. Abby was someone who was admired for her kindness and dedication to helping others. Abby was a mother of four and had experienced two marriages. 
Her first marriage in 2012, when she was only 18, she married her ex-husband, Alex Kwong, and became a mother to their two children, now aged 8 and 10. Despite divorcing Alex Kwong sometime before 2016, Abby went to great lengths to provide the best living environment for her ex-husband's family and their two children. She continued supporting them and extended her assistance to her ex-brother-in-law, Anthony Kwong, who also served as her personal chauffeur and business partner. On December 9, 2016, Abby tied the knot with Tam Chuk Kwan, also known as Chris Tam, the owner of the famous Tam's Rice Noodle Shop. In her second marriage, despite the joyous occasion and the birth of two children, it appears that Abby Choi and Tam's marriage weren't officially registered. The couple, along with their two children, had been living in a lavish mansion located in Ho Man Tin. On Tuesday, February 21, 2023, Abby was last seen wearing a white long sleeve top, white pants, and white slippers while carrying a purple handbag in CCTV footage. She had planned to pick up her daughter from her ex-husband. However, she didn't return home, leaving her husband Tam Chuk Kwan to report her as missing. Surveillance cameras captured her leaving the property on that day. The sudden nature of her disappearance raised suspicions with her family. Authorities promptly issued a missing person alert and urged the public to provide information as Abby was a well-known figure. When the police reviewed the CCTV footage, it revealed that she was picked up at the estate by a seven-seater car driven by her ex-brother-in-law, Anthony, who worked as her chauffeur before she went missing. The investigators questioned her ex-husband, Alex, and brother-in-law, Anthony, but they were uncooperative. The police eventually checked the vehicle's GPS records and looked at multiple security camera footage to locate Abby. Discovering that the seven-seater had been driven to Lung Mei Soon, a village in Tai Pao District, dozens of officers were immediately sent for thorough detective work. They conducted door-to-door -door interviews in the village and examined surveillance footage and dash camera videos from parked vehicles. Within 24 hours of arriving in the village, on February 24, 2023, the force identified the ground floor flat of a three-story house as a crime scene. Upon discovering the location, the police suspected she might have been kidnapped and held in that small apartment, where they believed nobody else would find her. They then entered the room, holding on to the hope that she might be okay. However, what they stumbled upon can only be described as a terrible horror show. The place did not have any regular furniture, and it looked more like a slaughterhouse than a regular apartment. Plastic sheeting covered the walls and windows in a way that no one from outside could see what was happening in the rooms. In addition, they found electric saws, a hammer, a meat grinder, face shields, and a raincoat, items one would wear to avoid blood splatter. Abby's handbag was also among the discoveries. Then the police went to the kitchen area and opened up the fridge casually. Upon opening it, they were horrified. Inside the fridge were human legs stacked on the shelves alongside a couple of pots. When they opened the pots, they initially appeared to contain a regular soup with broth, vegetables, and carrots. However, a closer inspection revealed what seemed to be minced meat. On a nearby table was a meat grinder, and at the bottom of one pot, they found human ribs and a skull. What about the, the, the head, okay? It's a skull, actually. It's no skin or any uh, meat uh, on it. So basically, it's a skull with hair, okay? As I said, unfortunately, there's a hole on the right side rear on the skull. Clue, we will do a thorough search again to find the torso and other parts of the missing body. The hole behind the right ear of her skull led the police to theorize the involvement of a hammer. Perhaps during a stop while driving, something unimaginable occurred when Abby wasn't looking. Officers from the Drainage Services Department arrived at the scene this afternoon to inspect the house and the surrounding areas. They checked if the sewerage system was blocked by any body parts and took samples to check for human tissue, according to sources. In connection with Abby Choi's murder case, her ex-husband's parents and brother were arrested on the same day her body was discovered. Despite her ex-husband being on the run, a reward of two million was offered for his capture, and eventually he was apprehended in Tung Chung while attempting to flee the country. While one group of police officers focused on the arrest, the other team worked on searching the apartment for remaining parts of Abby Choi's body and any additional evidence. The individuals in question were Abby Choi's ex-husband, Alex Kwan, 
Previously, he had been on the run for about seven and a half years since 2015. He faced charges of theft and fraud involving the alleged deception of four men into buying gold for investment, then fleeing with over 5 million Hong Kong dollars worth of gold. Despite an arrest warrant, he had managed to avoid arrest journeying between Hong Kong and China without facing legal consequences. Abby Choi's ex-brother-in-law, Anthony Kwong, who was 31 years old, had faced financial troubles in 2019. This accumulated a debt that exceeded 230,000 Hong Kong dollars owed to Citibank and eventually resulted in a lawsuit. Despite having no criminal record, he grappled with the substantial financial challenges. Anthony had a close relationship with Abby and often referred to her as Sis on Instagram. Abby's ex-father-in-law, Kao Kwong, a former Hong Kong police chief, had faced allegations of sexual assault in 2005, which ultimately led to his resignation. During that time, he allegedly accessed Abby's contact information through his professional role, maintaining communication beyond official duties. In 2004, a victim reported being assaulted by him at the Mid-Autumn Festival. Despite his arrest, he was released on bail, resigned in 2005, and never faced formal charges. A recent revelation from a friend indicated that his ex-father-in-law had threatened her 18 years ago, a threat that tragically came true. Abby Choi's ex-mother-in-law, Jenny Lee Su Hang, who was 63 years old and retired, had faced legal trouble for alleged evidence destruction and declared bankruptcy in 2017. Irene Puha Yin, a 29-year-old social media influencer, was linked to Abby's ex-husband and suspected of assisting in their escape. Henry Lam Shun, a 41-year-old yacht company employee, fell into the scheme for promise rewards, resulting in his arrest. The total number of arrests in the cases stood at six. In an attempt to mislead investigators, the suspects provided false information. Despite their efforts, an investigation and analysis of Abby's background and activities of the day of her disappearance gradually revealed the truth. Reports indicated that Abby was perceived as a money tree by her ex-husband's family, leading to ongoing disputes over financial matters that possibly contributed to her tragic fate. Speculations had emerged due to the absence of a legal marriage, suggesting that her assets could revert to her ex-husband upon her death, potentially serving as motivation for the crime. Then, as the truth came out, it was unveiled that Abby had purchased an upscale property in the exclusive Kadori Hill neighborhood in Ho Man Tin back in 2018. The 1,820-square-foot flat in the Kadoria housing complex was acquired for about 73 million Hong Kong dollars, purchased under her ex-father-in-law's name to avoid higher stamp duty fees of 3 million Hong Kong dollars. The luxurious property was bought using Abby's own funds with the intention to sell it and liquidate her assets. The tense situation arising from Abby's intention to sell the property might have triggered the chain of events leading to the tragic outcome. Shockingly, Abby's ex-father-in-law, a former officer who had risen to the rank of chief inspector, despite past involvement in an assault case, is suspected to be the mastermind behind the scheme. It has been revealed that the house in Lungmei Village, Taipo, where the dismemberment took place, was rented at the beginning of February by Kao Kuang, Abby's father-in-law. Notably, the unit was minimally furnished and had only a few pieces such as a sofa. What stood out was the absence of beds in both rooms and the interior walls and windows were covered with canvas, which effectively prevented outsiders from seeing what was happening inside. Late on February 21, 2003, Anthony drove Abby, supposedly to pick up her daughter. However, the unexpected stopped near a tunnel, at which point Alex forcefully entered the car. Hereafter is when the tragic and horrific fate took place, which took away Abby Choi's life, leaving her two kids and husband devastated. According to a neighbor near the scene, he was suspected of witnessing Abby's final moments. At around 10 p.m. on February 21, 2023, the day Abby went missing, he saw a woman in white with three to four individuals entering the house. The next thing, he heard sounds like objects hitting a window for about 10 minutes, along with muffled conversations. Another neighbor noted the arrested individuals had moved in a few weeks before, with an ex-father-in-law displaying fear. Mechanical noises from the unit were heard around 10 p.m. one evening, and a former village chief mentioned a seven-seater car leaving the house at around 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, potentially linked to the case. Later surveillance footage revealed 
someone dumping bags near the crime scene at Tai Po Longway Village. Subsequently, law enforcement concentrated their efforts on the dump site in search of evidence. Regrettably, Abby Choi's remains, including her torso and hands, were not discovered. The fact that they planned everything, right from renting an apartment in early February to transforming it into a body disposal workshop with all the necessary tools, is profoundly unsettling. Anthony, under the disguise of picking up Abby to meet her daughter, betrayed her expectations and led her to the horrifying place they had created. There, they ended her life. What adds to this unsettling nature of this tragedy is Alex's audacity to plan an escape with a substantial amount of money, accompanied by two individuals who were well aware of the entire situation, assisting him with a speedboat. Abby's death was not a result of a mistake or panic. Every move was carefully calculated. This is not just sad. It's truly unsettling how they plan and executed each step, leaving a chilling mark on this tragic story. Following this gruesome discovery, a 47-year-old woman named Ning Chi Wing, later identified as Kao Kwong's mistress, was caught for supposedly helping the main suspect, Alex Kwong. She played a crucial role in finding the spot where Abby's body was found and even arranged a hiding place for Alex, who wanted to escape the city quickly using a boat. The big plan was all about avoiding the authorities and making a break from Hong Kong, but the game didn't last long. After a citywide search, Alex was caught red-handed at Tung Chung Pier on Lantau Island, just as he was trying to escape on a speedboat. At the time of his capture, Alex wasn't exactly traveling light. He had a whopping $500,000 in Hong Kong cash on him and a collection of fancy watches worth about 4 million Hong Kong dollars. And along with him, the friends who helped him set up a speedboat for escape. Irene Poon Ha Yin, 28, and Lam Shun, 41, were arrested too. They seemed to be well aware of Alex's alleged involvement in the murder. The net widened, catching not only the Kwong family, but also three others who pitched in. Abby's former husband, Alex Kwong Kong Chi, age 28, and his brother, Anthony Kwong Kong Ki, age 31, were charged with murder. Ka Kwong, age 65, the father of Alex and Anthony, and Abby's former father-in-law was similarly charged with murder. Jenny Lee Sui Hing, age 63, Abby's former mother-in-law, was accused of perverting the course of justice. Nick Chi Wing, age 47, identified as Kwong Ka's mistress, was charged with assisting a murder suspect. Additionally, Henry Lam Shun, age 41, described as Alex's friend, and Irene Pu Ha Yin, age 29, both faced charges of abetting a murder suspect. The accused had attempted to mislead investigators, but the police disclosed crucial DNA evidence from the victim found in bloodstains on a car seat, the house, and cooking utensils. The trial involving all seven suspects was postponed until December 20, 2023. On that date, the charges were finalized against Alex, his father, Cow, and elder brother, Anthony, as murder and prevention of the lawful burial of the socialite's body. Alex's mother, Jenny, will stand trial on count of perverting the course of justice in the lower district court, where a sentencing cap of seven years of imprisonment applies. The magistrate also rejected Miss Lee's bail application and extended the four suspects' time behind bars. Lam Shun and Irene Poon Ha Yin were granted bail of 50,000 Hong Kong dollars until their cases went to trial. All the suspects are expected to go on trial early next year. On March 1, 2023, Abby's husband, Tom Chuck Kwan, made his first public appearance. Accompanied by both sets of parents, they visited the Fushan Public Mortuary in Taiwan to identify Abby's body. Later, they proceeded to the crime scene in Long May Village for a memorial spirit summoning ceremony. During the ceremony, Abby's mother expressed overwhelming grief, and her aunt condemned the heartless and ruthless perpetrator. Tam, who was grateful for his time with Abby, expressed his wish for her to rest in peace. Abby's funeral, held on June 18, 2023, cost over 3 million Hong Kong dollars. The Tam family organized the event with deep respect, restoring Abby's dismembered body at a reported cost of 2 million Hong Kong dollars. Friends and relatives were struck by the lifelike appearance. In an exclusive interview, Tam addressed misconceptions, expressing sorrow and pledging to become a better person and father. Concerns arose over breaking the tragic news to Abby's four children. Her older son and daughter already knew, affecting them deeply. The family decided to keep the information hidden from the younger children for now. 
As we conclude this narrative, it's important to recognize that Abby Choi's case stands as one of the most horrific, marked by intense planning. Four individuals had the opportunity to reconsider their actions, to step down, and choose the right path, yet they proceeded to take away the life of a caring and generous person. It's disheartening to reflect on how a simple conversation could have resolved the underlying issues. The twisted minds of individuals, collectively making such grave decisions, highlight the darker facets of human nature. The fact that her ex-husband fled when the police arrested the family only adds to the unsettling reality. It underscores the absence of guilt, regret, or remorse within the family. On February 12, 1993, the Garcia family was having a regular day at their home in San Antonio, Texas. 15-year-old Emily Garcia was feeling carefree and enjoying the day's laid-back atmosphere. Around 1 p.m., Emily and her mother Sheila left the house together. They were heading to visit a friend, and Sheila dropped Emily off at a nearby bus stop. Later that evening, around 10 p.m., Sheila came back home from work expecting to see Emily, but she hadn't returned home by then. She thought maybe Emily was spending the night at her friend's house. But the situation got even scarier the next morning, when Emily was still nowhere to be found. What made it even more disturbing was that the Garcia family faced many challenges when trying to report Emily as missing. They had to deal with the stress of not knowing where she was, and the difficulty of getting the authorities to take their concerns seriously. Even with Emily's family and the community's consistent efforts, she never returned home. What could have transpired after Emily was dropped off at the bus stop, leading to her disappearance? How did the Garcia family overcome the hurdles in reporting Emily missing? San Antonio, known for its vibrant culture and historical landmarks, has also seen its share of crime. From gang-related violence to drug trafficking, the city grapples with various criminal activities. Despite efforts by law enforcement and community organizations to address these issues, crime continues to be a concern in certain neighborhoods. One such case unfolded within its landscape in February 1993 and shocked the whole community. On July 27, Fort Hood, Texas, Roy Garcia and Sheila Smith Ramirez happily welcomed their second daughter into the world. They already had a daughter named Elizabeth Joy Garcia, born just over a year earlier. They named their new baby girl, Emily Jeanette Garcia. She was a total people person, always having a blast with her friends and her close-knit family. Whether they were out and about, watching movies, or organizing epic picnics, they did it all together, strengthening their bonds. Emily also had a fantastic flair for music that added a special touch to her life. In her early years, she was said to have a bit of a moody side, but don't let that fool you. She adored being around people, soaking up the good times with her friends and family, especially with her sister, Elizabeth. They were like two peas in a pod, sharing all their moments and secrets. However, as they got older, their closeness faded, like a story taking an unexpected turn. Their relationship stayed a bit distant, and this continued until the year 1993, when everything changed in their lives. In the new year of 1993, while living in San Antonio, Texas, Sheila got a big surprise when her daughters Elizabeth and 15-year-old Emily shared that they were both expecting babies. Sheila found it hard to believe at first, but she loved her daughters and stood by them and gave them her full support. Even though Sheila wasn't thrilled about the news, she urged her daughters to go to the hospital for checkups to confirm the pregnancies. Once the news was confirmed, Sheila put in every effort to make her daughters feel loved and supported, even though they didn't know who the fathers of their children were. It was important to her that her daughters knew they weren't facing this situation alone. February 12, 1993 was like any other day for the Garcia family. Emily casually walked up to her mother and said, Hey mom, I'm thinking of visiting a friend today. 
Since they were good friends, and Emily had been to her friend's house a bunch of times before, Sheila said yes without hesitation. So, after finishing up their chores, Sheila and Emily headed out together. On the way, Emily asked her mother if she could drop her off at the bus stop, as she wanted to go on to her friends on her own from there. From there, she also had an appointment with the health service to see how far along she was in her pregnancy. Sheila agreed, and on her way to work, she stopped at the bus stop to let Emily off, reminding her to be back home on time that evening. Everything seemed normal, just like any other day, right? But what was about to happen would turn into a living nightmare for the Garcia family. When Sheila returned home around 10 p.m., she realized that Emily had still not returned, even though it had been over six hours since she was supposed to be home. Sheila started to feel uneasy, wondering if something had gone wrong or if Emily needed help getting back. Sheila just wanted to find out what was happening, but everything remained silent. As time passed with no word from Emily, the whole family grew increasingly worried. They tried to reassure themselves, thinking maybe Emily had stayed at her friend's house for the night. They hoped that maybe she had just forgotten to let them know. So they waited until the next morning, as Emily might return home on her own. But when the sun rose and she still wasn't back, they grew really anxious. That's when they knew they had to take action. On February 13, 1993, the family made a tough call and decided to contact the police. They couldn't shake off the worry, especially since Emily hadn't shown up and wasn't answering their calls. At 9 a.m., Sheila called the Texas Police Department. It had been almost 20 hours since anyone had heard from Emily. But guess what? The police dismissed their concerns and said they had to wait some more time before they could label Emily as missing. Sheila and her family were beyond frustrated because they knew something wasn't right, but the police seemed to be in no rush to help. Their excuse was that since Emily was pregnant, maybe she had just left with the person she was having the baby with and would come back eventually. But Emily's family knew better. In their hearts, they knew Emily wouldn't vanish without a trace. She was reliable and always made sure her family knew she was all right. What's more, she didn't even take any of her personal belongings. No clothes, no shoes, no cash. All she had was her purse with a bit of money. This was completely unlike Emily, who never acted this way before. Emily's family had this strong gut feeling that something was seriously wrong. They kept telling the police over and over again, Emily didn't go with anyone. She is not fine. But the police wouldn't listen. They flat out said there was no evidence of a crime, no sign she was kidnapped, no one was harmed, and Emily wasn't in danger. They didn't even want to alert the community that Emily was missing so people could keep an eye out for her. This left the family feeling incredibly frustrated because they knew time was ticking away and every moment counted in finding Emily. When Elizabeth, Emily's sister, heard all of this, she was just stunned and heartbroken. Despite any differences they may have had, she couldn't understand how Emily could go off with someone without telling the family, especially considering what they were going through. Emily's family wasn't going to just sit around twiddling their thumbs. With no help from the police, they decided to take action themselves. They launched their own search and investigation to find Emily. They hit the streets of the neighborhood, giving out flyers and asking everyone if they had seen Emily on the night she vanished. They even showed everyone a picture of Emily, urging them to really think back and remember if they had seen her walking around or noticed anything unusual that could help in finding her. At this point, two scary theories emerged. Either Emily went off with someone willingly, or she was kidnapped and harmed by a dangerous person. Both possibilities terrified the Garcia family, so they started putting more pressure on the police to step up their efforts. So under intense pressure from the family, the police finally sprang into action. They began interviewing people who were close to Emily, including the friend she was supposed to meet that day. However, the friend revealed that Emily never showed up at her house. She waited and waited, but Emily never arrived. This confirmed that something had happened to Emily after Sheila dropped her off at the bus stop. 
And if she didn't arrive at her friend's house, that meant she also didn't go to the hospital where she had an appointment after visiting her friend. Despite this realization, the case seemed to be moving at a snail's pace. There were no press releases, no big breakthroughs in the investigation, and it felt like the police weren't really giving it their all to find Emily. Fortunately, all the pressure from Emily's family paid off, and the police finally decided to take action. They didn't want to face public criticism, so they issued a press statement about Emily's case. It was the first time they publicly admitted that Emily was missing and asked the community for help. However, strangely, they also mentioned that while any missing young person is considered at risk, they didn't believe Emily was in immediate danger or being held against her will. Sheila was incredibly thankful for the support from their community. Whenever they received a tip, no matter where it came from, they wasted no time in jumping into the car and heading to the location, holding on to hope that they might find Emily. Elizabeth, too, was unstoppable in her efforts. She traveled out of state and even organized rallies, all in her determined mission to find her sister. Thirteen days had gone by since Emily went missing, but the Garcia family didn't give up hope of finding her safe and sound. They kept pushing forward organizing press releases, rallies, TV interviews, and asking the community for help. Despite all their efforts, the case was frustratingly going nowhere. The police also didn't share any more updates at this time, which left everyone feeling worried and unsure about what to do next. It wasn't until February 25, 1993, that the police finally contacted the Garcia family for more details about Emily's case. Strangely, they also asked the family to stay strong and be prepared for a body verification if needed. This raised concerns among the family members, making them wonder why the police would make such a request. It felt like they were starting to consider the possibility Emily might not be alive. This shift in focus from finding a missing person to searching for a deceased body made the family feel uneasy and nervous. After all, no one wants to hear such terrible news about their loved ones. As the search for Emily continued, a passerby made a shocking discovery on the same evening. He spotted a woman's nude body about 1.5 miles north on the old Cranes Mill Road off of Highway 46 in Canyon Lake, Texas. Without wasting any time, he quickly reported the decomposing body to both the New Braunfels Police and Comal County Sheriff's Office. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found the body in a dreadful state, so they decided to send it to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. While waiting for the results, they thoroughly searched the surrounding area, but couldn't find any clues or evidence that could explain what happened to the woman or who was responsible. Despite their efforts, the mystery surrounding the woman's death remained unsolved. The condition of the woman's body was so severe that identifying her seemed almost impossible. Because of this, she was listed as a Jane Doe, meaning her identity was unknown. However, after examining the body, the medical examiner made a grim discovery. Jane Doe was not only a victim of murder, but tragically, she was pregnant with an unborn child. The examiner also revealed some disturbing details about the woman's death. He mentioned that she had been physically assaulted, asphyxiated, strangled, and had died approximately 8 to 10 hours before her body was found. During the autopsy, they even discovered unknown DNA on her body, which they suspected could belong to the killer. However, since medical technology wasn't as advanced at the time, it was hard to pinpoint whose DNA it was. So they collected it and stored it as evidence for future investigations hoping for advancements in technology that would help solve the case. With no identity and no leads on the killer, the woman's body was laid to rest as Jane Doe in a pauper's grave at Bracken Cemetery on March 30, 1993, arranged by Zoller's funeral home. Who was this mysterious woman, and could she have any connection to Emily's disappearance? These questions lingered unanswered while Emily's family carried on their unwavering efforts to find her. As time passed, her family continued to dedicate themselves fully to keeping her name in the public eye and ensuring that nobody forgot to keep searching for her. 
There even came a moment when Sheila bravely opened up about her feelings of loneliness and frustration during an interview. She spoke about the countless places she had traveled to in pursuit of leads, and her heartfelt words were truly moving to listen to. Sheila couldn't stop crying in fear. She didn't know what had really happened to Emily, if someone had left her somewhere, taken her, tied her up, or put her in a dangerous place. She couldn't shake the feeling of uncertainty. Each day, she imagined different possibilities of what could have happened to her daughter. Then, after a whole year, in 1994, Sheila finally got an answer. But sadly, it wasn't the one she had been hoping for. A friend of Emily, whose name hasn't been shared, had been keeping an eye on Emily's case for the whole year. She noticed something peculiar. The Jane Doe found a year earlier had similarities to Emily. Both were pregnant at the time, and the Jane Doe was discovered around the same time Emily went missing. However, since the Jane Doe hadn't been identified yet, the friend called Sheila, Emily's mother, to share her suspicion that the Jane Doe could actually be Emily. This news deeply troubled Sheila, but she still held on to hope that the woman wouldn't turn out to be her daughter. Despite her fears, she decided to contact the police. In a stroke of luck, the Garcias had taken hand impressions of their whole family as a keepsake in the past, and this included Emily's fingerprints. With this crucial piece of evidence, the police were able to confirm the heartbreaking truth. The Jane Doe was indeed Emily Garcia. This revelation brought both closure and devastation to Sheila and her family. It wasn't the news anyone had hoped for. Instead of the joy of welcoming Emily home safely, the family had to face the devastating truth that she had lost her life. This heartbreaking reality was made even more painful by the months they had spent desperately urging authorities to take the case seriously. They knew in their hearts that something terrible had happened, but their cries for help had gone unanswered. It was a deeply painful realization for them all. But while it was the most unimaginable news, it also brought a sense of relief to the family. Finally, they knew where Emily was. This gave the family a chance to bring her home, give her a proper burial, and provide her with the resting peace she deserved. Now they had a place where they could visit her, remember her, and talk to her whenever they needed to. Her body was taken from its resting place and reburied under her birth name in a cemetery in Somerset, Texas. A whole nine years after Emily was identified, Sheila shared some surprising revelations. She received Emily's original death certificate on September 9, 2003. What caught her off guard was that instead of Emily being named as Jane Doe, the name box simply stated, not applicable. Emily was also inaccurately listed as being of Caucasian descent on her death certificate, despite her actually being of Hispanic origin. This discrepancy raised questions, but it's been debated that determining her ethnicity could have been extremely challenging for investigators. This was likely due to the condition of Emily's body when it was discovered, which added another layer of complexity to the case. It didn't end there. Emily's death was attributed to strangulation, according to the official reports. However, several media outlets speculated that she may have also suffered physical abuse and could have been murdered before being tied up. These conflicting reports added to the already numerous inconsistencies in the case. As a result, various theories were proposed and debated over time, making it difficult to determine the truth behind Emily's tragic demise. Once Emily's body was identified, the big question on everyone's mind was, who could have done such a thing to a 15-year-old girl, and why? It's baffling because there were no clues about who might have been responsible for Emily's death, apart from the foreign DNA evidence found on her body. There weren't even any descriptions of suspects over the years, leaving the Garcia family desperate for answers. They were determined to fight for justice for Emily and her unborn child, even though they didn't know who they were fighting against. The case stayed open, but it seemed like all the leads had dried up. Some people thought Emily might have been randomly attacked by a stranger, while others believed her killer could have been someone she knew. Many questions remained unanswered throughout. 
Was there anyone else at the bus stop when Emily disappeared? Did she get on that bus? And if she did, where did she get off? Were there any witnesses who saw Emily with her captor on the day she vanished? And why was the information on the death certificate so different from what happened? The biggest question of all, who killed her and why? These questions kept the mystery alive, with no clear answers in sight. Sadly, as time went by, hope of solving the case grew dimmer due to the lack of information. However, the Garcia family refused to give up. They continued to share Emily's story, hoping it might jog someone's memory or prompt them to come forward with any details about what happened to her. Even though it seemed unlikely that the case would ever be solved, they believed that keeping Emily's story alive could still make a difference. For more than two decades, the Garcia family tirelessly campaigned for justice for Emily. They even created several web pages in her name in hopes to gather any information that could lead to solving her murder. Finally, their perseverance paid off when they received the news they had all been longing for. All their prayers and efforts finally led to a breakthrough in Emily's case. In 2017, the Comal County Sheriff's Office decided to take another look at Emily's case. Then, in early 2021, they reached out to the Texas Rangers Unsolved Crimes Investigation Program for assistance. The first thing they did was interview people who knew Emily well, hoping to gather new information that could help solve the case. This was the beginning of a fresh investigation into Emily's disappearance and murder. The police wanted to delve deeper into Emily's connections and uncover any possible motives for her murder. During the interviews, they learned about a man who had been staying with friends in northeastern San Antonio around the time of her death. This raised suspicions, as Emily was known to frequent that area, and they believed he might have information relevant to their case. So they focused on gathering more details about him and his potential involvement. Emily often spent time at pool halls and socializing with friends in that part of the city. It was there that she met Thomas Ray Galindo, a 21-year-old acquaintance. While most of the interviews with her friends seemed routine, some unusual details emerged during Galindo's interview, which had not been officially revealed, and this caught the attention of the police. These revelations sparked suspicion and led authorities to consider him a key suspect in Emily's case. At this moment, they decided to dig into the evidence box in hopes to find something useful from the old investigation. That's when they stumbled upon a real game-changer, foreign DNA found on Emily's body that had been carefully preserved all these years. While testing this DNA had been impossible before, recent advances in medical science made it feasible. Essentially, they had found a key that could unlock the mystery surrounding Emily's case. So in September 2021, the police paid a visit to Galindo, now a 50-year-old resident of Comal County, and requested his DNA for a routine check. Apart from him, they also asked for the DNA from every person involved in their interviews, as in such a case, everyone is a suspect. But something about his demeanor in specific caught their attention. He seemed uneasy, reluctant even, to hand over his DNA. This little detail only fueled their suspicions, so they decided to keep a close watch on him until the final reports came in. Even though they hit a wall the first two times they ran the DNA, which returned as failed tests, the top criminologist at the cold case unit stumbled upon two overlooked samples from Emily's body. It was like finding a hidden treasure. And against all odds, she worked her magic and pulled out a partial male profile from those samples. It was practically a miracle, but it breathed new life into the investigation. After carefully comparing all profiles to find a match, the team slowly but surely eliminated suspects until they reached a conclusion that wasn't exactly surprising. Galindo was the man responsible for Emily's murder. His DNA perfectly matched the DNA found on Emily's body, sealing his fate as her assailant. It turned out, he was the one who attacked and ended Emily's life back in February 1993. With the evidence in hand, the police finally swooped in and arrested Thomas Ray Galindo at his home in Comal County on Friday, September 10, 2021. Back when Emily was killed, Galindo was just 21 years old. 
While there isn't a ton of information out there about his court proceedings, what we do know is this. He's currently cooling his heels in the Comal County Jail, and they've set his bond at a hefty $100,000. He's yet to reveal his motive behind the murder, and if he has, the authorities have not revealed this information to the public just yet. He's waiting to face charges for snuffing out the lives of an innocent woman and her unborn child. The Garcia family is on pins and needles, waiting to see what verdict is reached in the case and whether Galindo will be found guilty. It's a gut-wrenching reality for them, knowing that the same person Emily once chatted with likely ended up being the one to end her life. They'll never get to meet Emily's child, a fact that's like a permanent scar on their hearts. What are your thoughts about the case? If Galindo did indeed kill Emily, what do you think was his motive behind it? Was it because he made a mistake that evening, or was there something more behind the scenes?